I was at a bustling party, waiting for the one who would decide whether I'd won my cousin's bet or not. Forget your dumb ex. 50 bucks if you get the number of the next guy walking through that door. Oh, here comes my target. I hurriedly approached him, but stumbled and we're kissing. I could feel the taste of grapes on his lips. I immediately pushed him away and stood up. Uh, f phone number, please. The guy looked confused, but still handed me a note. All done. Time to flee the scene. Hi, I'm Agatha, a super introvert who hiccups when nervous. And lucky enough, my kooky cousin dragged me to this crazy party. I ran home to see Mum looking all excited. Oh, my sweet child, you're back already. It's just not my thing, Mom. But cooking is. I have some amazing news. The local soccer club is looking for a chef, so I recommended you. And guess what? They said you can start ASAP. Yes, I've dreamt of becoming a chef since I was little. And now that dream will soon come true. Yahoo! Today's the day. I eagerly arrived at the soccer club, but my jaw almost hit the floor when I saw Mateo, my ex. What was he doing here? Flustered, I looked away and saw that guy from the party. What on earth? My life's officially over. After the introduction, I immediately ran to the pitch for some fresh air, but then a hand patted my shoulder. It's him again. No calls or texts? You asked for my number. Are you that shy? <laughs> I'm Killian, by the way. It, it was just a joke. I... Please leave. But then he stepped even closer. Panicked, I pushed him away. Almost made him fall backward. I tried to catch him, but... Not again. This time he smells like chocolate. Oh, you like my lips this much? Why not just say so? <gasps> Holy moly! I ran straight away without looking back. I better stay ten miles away from him. Suddenly I saw Mateo passing by. Has he seen anything? But why bother? As if he cared, he dumped me. Okay, Agatha, you're here to work, so focus. But with these jocks around, it's not that easy. They always jump-scared me when I was doing my job and made fun of me when I got lost in the changing room. And Killian was always there in time to save me. Everyone, stop. Close your eyes. Then he threw a super stinky, sweaty towel at my face. Ew. Plus, that jerk is the pickiest eater on this planet. He's constantly complaining about my food and demanded I cook him something else. There you go. I'm cutting on starch to build muscles. I'll get rid of the pasta. Oops, I forgot. I'm lactose intolerant. Okay, no cheese. Poor little chicken. I can't eat that. So, are you allergic to the plate too? Meanwhile, other team members were way easier, especially Mateo. We used to date, so I knew his taste pretty well. I gave you some extra pork, your favorite. I don't like pork. I hate pigs. Just then, Killian jumped in. You should focus on me instead. We can discuss my meals privately. Before I could say anything, he already handed me a note. Me and him alone? That's weird. But learning his eating habit would help my job, right? Nope. Big mistake. Killian had an endlessly absurd list of diet restrictions. No more than 2.5 grams of salt a day, mayonnaise on everything, no mushrooms, and spaghetti without tomato sauce? Did he just descend onto Earth? And during the meal, this dude kept smiling and staring at me. You like me or something? You have a veggie on your teeth. Dude! Oh, gosh! I immediately ran to the restroom, but Killian caught up with me, holding a ball of wool. Is this yours? I looked down to see a wool thread coming out of my dress's hemline. Ah! Oh gosh, I wish the ground just swallowed me whole right now. Surprisingly, Killian put his jacket on me. That was cool. Just then he caught me drooling over him, so I immediately pretended to play with my phone. <laughs> I just want to beat level 9674 in Candy Crush. Strangely, over the next few days, Mateo started being nice to me. Too nice. Your cooking is top-notch as always. Tomorrow, can you make me those delicious vegetable fritters we used to have together? He still remembered that? Boy, he made my heart race. I sprinted to the kitchen and put on music to calm down. Soon, I found myself singing and dancing to my jam. I promise that you'll never find another like me. He he! Ooh, 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 ooh! Mamma mia! How long had he been there? Flustered, I burnt myself. Killian rushed over and held my hand. You okay? You can't even handle yourself? Then he insisted on finishing my work and even prepared us a dish. Wah, his broad back. Isn't he quite a charmer when he cooks? 
We talked a lot, and turns out, we share a ton of things in common. Beneath his teasing, he's actually gentle, caring, and a good listener. I suddenly realized that I had stopped hiccuping since ages. One afternoon, while giving out water, I saw Killian. Oh wow, it's like the sunshine drew a halo around him in his exquisite face. Wait a minute, why was I smiling? Suddenly, a fancy-looking girl came over. Killian, why didn't you reply to my messages? You left me hanging all night! Look, I have dark circles now. That's on you. I went to leave, but out of nowhere, Mateo pulled me into a corner. Why were you so close to him? He's only messing with me. Huh? What do you mean? He competes with me in everything. I was cold to you to protect you. Now that he knows you're important to me, he'll harm you to hurt me. I think he's just trying to be nice? His dad is our club's biggest sponsor. You really think he wants to hang out with people like us while Sloane, whose family owns the largest hospital in the state, is here? I don't know what to believe anymore. However, I had to admit they looked like a perfect couple. While holding a coffee tray one time, I clumsily bumped into Sloane. Are you blind? Why do they let a doofus work here? Come on, Sloane, you bumped into her. He sure seemed sweet to me. Maybe Mateo had misunderstood him. Then once, I spotted the two of them in a quarrel where Killian even pushed Mateo. I tried to intervene, but they brushed me off. What was going on between them? A few days later, I returned from the grocery store to see the head coach in a fit of rage. Explain to me how Mateo is hospitalized for eating your food. What? Why? Stop it. You're fired. My head spun in a million circles. I hadn't done anything wrong. I was packing my things when Sloane appeared. Well, well, well. Looks like little Miss Muffet met her match. Only need some simple tricks to get rid of you and your phony, needy act. Stop dreaming about Killian. You're not at our level. Wait, our? Who's with you? But Sloan just smirked and strutted away. That's when the memory of Killian and Mateo fighting struck my mind. So Killian must have conspired with Sloan to harm Mateo and ruin my career in the process? How could he? Still, he had the cheek to text me as if nothing had happened. Dummy, Agatha. You should have listened to Mateo from the start and stayed away from Killian. I visited Mateo in the hospital, but he coldly shooed me away. It was exactly like the day he dumped me. Today is the city's championship final, and to be honest, I didn't really know why I was here. I looked around for Mateo, but couldn't find him. He might still be sick, so we had to skip this match. On the field, Killian seemed distracted and off his game. What's wrong with him today? Killian, my dear. The lady sitting next to me looked nervous and kept fidgeting. I spoke to her and figured out she was Killian's mom. She told me the shocking news. His little sister was missing. He was blackmailed into making their team lose or he'd never see his sister again. Killian faced the goal, but he didn't kick. Instead, he passed to another player who then scored the goal. The spectators cheered in triumph, while other players celebrated the goal with Killian. Blood seemed to have drained from his face. As predicted, the threats kept coming. I couldn't just sit and pray, so I asked Killian's mom for more clues. She played me the recording of her daughter. I strained my ears to listen and heard a noise. Peekaboo! Peekaboo! I know that sound. It's Mateo's parrot! Ma'am, I know who's behind this. It's Mateo! What? I can excuse fake food poisoning, but how dare he harm my Killian? Ugh, say it again, Sloan. He asked me to fake the medical paper, and I figured it would also kick you out, so I agreed. But what about Killian's sister? That was nothing to do with me, I swear. We rushed to Mateo's house. It took him forever to open the door. Mateo, are you okay now? I... I have thought a lot... about us, and realized how important you are to me. And I don't want to lose you again. Mateo, could you? Oh, please. Look at yourself. I just dated you for fun. You truly think I like you? <laughs> and no more pork for me, please. Do you seriously think I'd want you back after the despicable things you did to me and Killian? Killian? Props to that freak for coming at me for telling the truth. So pathetic of him to go for my leftovers. It's you, dummy. Then he blurted out how he cooked up this entire scheme to ruin Killian's career out of the jealousy which was triggered when he visited him in the hospital and told him not to worry about missing the match as they've had a new strategy to cover his absence and the team would perform well anyway. I'm not a pawn that can easily be kicked out. You wish. You are 
pathetic. Right then, Sloane appeared with the little girl. Let's go. There's no time. Where are you going, Agatha? Admit it. You're still smitten with me. Sorry, the old Agatha can't come to the phone right now. Why? Oh, because she's dead. After that, we rushed to the stadium. There, I shouted out Killian's name and raised his sister's hands. He seemed surprised to see us, then nodded and smiled. Afterwards, he played like a pro and led his team to victory. He was even awarded player of the match. It's an honor to receive this title, and I want to shout out to someone important. Without her, this wouldn't have happened. Agatha, thank you so much. Countless cameras turned to me. Then he rushed over to drag me to a corner where I told him everything. I know Mateo's a jerk, but I didn't expect him to be that bad. But no worries. Let's see how he likes being permanently banned from the soccer club. Agatha, I, um, want to tell you that I found something just as important as soccer. You. He then grabbed my face and pressed his lips against mine. Finally, we had a legit kiss, and it was magical. Hey, what's with the long face? Oh, hey, it's nothing, just a bad day. You know, you can tell me everything, right? I'm your best friend, so I know when something is up with you. Spit it out. Okay, you're right, as always. (laughs) I think you should hang on to something, because this is shocking news. I- Oh? My god. Who is that? He looks so gorgeous. Sue, are you even listening? Huh? What did you just say? I turned to him, but he mumbled out typical, then walked away. Jeez, what's his problem? Oh, that was Lucas earlier. My best friend since kindergarten. Don't mind him, he's always like this. But whatever, let's get back to this handsome guy. So it turns out his name is Alex, and he's new here. I knew it, because such a pretty boy like him would never go unnoticed by me. The next morning, I couldn't wait to walk to school with Lucas. I had some amazing news to tell him. It happened to me the night before, during my shift at the diner. Lucas, you won't believe who was in the diner yesterday. Robert Downey Jr.? What? No, it was Alex, the new student. Gosh, Lucas, you've got to help me get his attention. You're on the baseball team together, right? Huh? Do you like that guy? Seriously? Duh. I mean, look at him. He's like Timothy Chalamet's twin brother. So will you help me, please? Ugh, fine. Hmm. I did hear him say he likes girls on roller skates. I have an idea. The next time he comes to the diner, serve him on skates. It's a sure way to impress him. Oh, yes, that's a great idea. I hugged Lucas to thank him. So the next time Alex came into the diner, I took out my roller skates and was ready to serve him his spaghetti. I'm kind of a novice on skates, so I slowly slid over to him. So far, so good, until I didn't see that somebody had spilled their milkshake all over the floor. And yes, of course, I slipped. Oh, no. I quickly covered my head to avoid the spaghetti plate, but huh? The plate had fallen on the floor, but where was the spaghetti? I looked around. Oh, snap. I found it. It landed on Alex's head. It was so humiliating. But worse still, as hard as I tried, I couldn't get back on my feet. Ugh, stupid skates. I repeatedly apologized to him. At first, Alex looked totally shocked. Then, perhaps because of my pathetic look, He couldn't hold it in anymore and burst out laughing. (laughs) Well, at least you dare to slide on them. I, on the other hand, am not a big fan of those. (laughs) What? What did he mean by that? Ugh, Lucas! The next day, I went looking for Lucas to confront him. He was easy to find, as he was in his favorite place to browse in town, the sneaker store. Why did you tell me Alex likes roller skates? Because he definitely doesn't. (laughs) Maybe I misheard him. Oh, wait, he likes girls in superhero costumes. That's right. What? That sounds ridiculous. Forget it, I'm not listening to you anymore. Go give your advice to some other poor girl, not me. What's up with Lucas? Why would he give me such bad advice? It's like he wanted me to fail. But why? Oh my goodness. Was he, maybe, into me? Nah, nonsense. Still... 
I had a feeling about it. So I decided to avoid Lucas as much as possible. I came up with loads of excuses not to hang out with him, such as mom was driving me to school and I was skipping lunch because I was on a diet. Ugh, it was so exhausting. I mean, have you ever tried sneakily eating your lunch in class so you don't pass out from hunger? However, this was necessary, as we both needed some space. It's the only way to keep our friendship safe. But then one day, Lucas messaged me. Can we talk after school? I have something important to tell you. Oh no. Was he going to confess his feelings? But if he did it, our friendship would be ruined. I couldn't let that happen, so I didn't meet him. Instead, I ran straight home. He called me a bunch of times, but I ignored them all. I ghosted him, to be exact. Jeez, I wasn't proud, but I had to save our friendship from stupid Cupid. But then the next time I saw him, he only gave me a hurt look and purposely walked off in the other direction. Oh, no. Now it was basically like a cold war between us. Ugh. We might not have been hanging out with each other, but I was still keeping an eye on Lucas. I'd been watching him for a couple of days, and it looked like he was having a tough time. He must have figured out my rejection, so now he was miserable. Oh, dear Lucas, I didn't want this to happen, but I can't risk losing our friendship. But then I noticed something. One time, the whole school went on a picnic trip. I watched Lucas from afar and noticed that he was giving dagger looks to a bunch of girls. Hmm, hang on. They were surrounding Alex. I even saw him trip another girl up who was going to join the group of girls adoring Alex. And then he made out it was an accident. Another time, I overheard him telling girls from other classes who were standing by the class door trying to get a glimpse of Alex that he pretended to be all cold and quiet because he had hideous teeth. Which, of course, wasn't true, because he had a smile that could light up a room. Ah, uh, looks like it wasn't just me. Lucas didn't want any other girls going near Alex. Did he hate Alex that much? Or, or, he likes Alex? For heaven's sake! Stop thinking such nonsense, Sue! Your head was messing with you. Then one day, my mom heard that Lucas's mom was sick, so she made some chicken soup and told me to bring it over to his mom. I didn't want to go around there. I mean, what if I saw Lucas? Awkward. But who was I to deny a sick lady soup? When I arrived, I opened the door and let myself in as I usually do. And that's when I heard the conversation between Lucas and his mom. Lucas, you need to forget about Alex. I want to, but I can't, mom. He's always on my mind. <sighs> anyway, the important thing is your health. You need to eat something. Look at you, you're not getting any better. How can I eat? After your dad left us, it's like all this time I've been living in a lie. I'm so sorry. Wait a moment. My Sherlock Holmes intuition was kicking in. Now everything makes sense. Why Lucas was sad for a couple of days, why I hadn't seen his dad for a while, and why his mom was suddenly sick. It's because Lucas was gay. His father probably didn't take it so well, so he left, which was really devastating for Lucas's mom. But I'm his best friend. Why didn't he tell me? Man... He hid it really well. But not only that, he also tried to sabotage me when he knew I had a crush on Alex. Well, it turns out we weren't best friends like I thought. Ugh. But no, I couldn't just ignore this. I needed to talk to Lucas to clear things up. The next day, Lucas had baseball practice. So I went to find him at the field, but he wasn't there. I asked some of his teammates, but nobody knew where he was. Hmm, where could he have gone? And that's when I saw Lucas with Alex behind the bleachers. Well, well, well. Look at them, all lovey-dovey. They talked for a bit, then each of them walked away in a different direction. I watched them from a distance with my arms folded. That traitor! I was so ready to yell in Lucas's face. And that's when our eyes met. He was startled when he saw me, like he'd just been busted. Well, it was technically the correct word to describe the situation. Sue, Su Su what are you doing here? Why do you look so flustered? Come on, I know about your relationship between you and Alex, so you don't need to hide it anymore. How, how did you know about it? I heard you and your mom talking about it, but I don't understand. How could you do this to me? You knew that I liked Alex. I know, but I couldn't explain. I was so ashamed. You should have talked to me first, but instead you stole Alex from me. Best friends don't do that to each other. Hold on a minute. What did you just say? I stole Alex from you? What do you mean? Ugh, come on. Just stop with all this hiding and lying. I know you two are together. What? Why was he overreacting like this? Was what I just said not true? Well, turns out it wasn't. I was totally wrong. Just one thing was for sure. My detective intuition sucked. 
And that's when Lucas told me the truth. Lucas and Alex weren't in love. Lucas even hated Alex because he's Lucas's half-brother. Oh my. It's like I got lost in a telenovela or something. When my mom was pregnant with me, my dad got drunk and made a big mistake with a colleague of his. She fell pregnant with Alex, but my dad didn't know about it. Then a month ago, Alex's mom was diagnosed with a serious illness. She didn't want him to end up alone if she couldn't make it. So she showed up in dad's life again and messed everything up. Oh my god. So that's why Lucas's mom all of a sudden got so skinny and sick. And Lucas's dad didn't leave them. No, it's because his mom kicked his dad out of the house. I wanted to tell you in the canteen the other day, but you were too starry-eyed over Alex to listen. This made me mad, so I tried everything to prevent you from getting close to him. My family's broken because of him, so I don't want my best friend to fall for someone like that. Oh, it turns out I'm a really bad friend. My best friend had problems at home, and I didn't even know it. No, because I was busy daydreaming about a guy I barely knew. I apologized to Lucas and promised that I would pay more attention to him. And then we hugged. On the plus side, at least none of my crazy theories were true. <laughs> so it turns out it was all just one big misunderstanding. The Cold War between us ended, and our friendship remains as amazing as ever. I also managed to convince Lucas and Alex to give each other a chance. After all, they're half-brothers, and what happened between their parents wasn't their fault. Besides, Alex's mom is seriously ill, so he needs Lucas more than ever. It's great hanging out with them both and seeing them laughing and joking about. Ah, peace at last. The three of us have become pretty great friends. Oh, do you want to hear something funny? Lucas actually offered to matchmake me with Alex. <laughs> but it's okay. I refused. Why, you ask? Well, the three of us are such awesome friends now, and I don't want anything to ruin that. Pretty mature of me, right? <laughs> it's the country's fair day today, or as I like to call it, my winning day. See that huge plushie over there? It's about to become mine. Ready, set, and yes, bullseye! I excitedly took the bear when it suddenly got yanked away by this crazy bull. Hey, I won that bear fair and square, but I saw it first. Now hand it over, hobbit. Hobbit? I yanked the bear from him, but it ended up ripping in half. His girlfriend burst into tears, and now I'm like a red rag to him. He rushed towards me, and before I could even think straight, my fist took over. How many times have I told you, Angie? A girl doesn't just raise her fist and cause trouble like that. It was self-defense. He was gonna hit me, Mom. I'm done with this. Like father, like daughter. Why are you even bringing him up? He left us years ago, so let him stay out of our lives. Even thinking about him made my blood boil. I turned to the window, avoiding the look I knew my mom was giving me. When we got home, we found the door open. Something wasn't right. I quickly ran into the house and saw black shadows standing in our living room. Who are you people? What are you doing in my house? All hail our new leader! The lights suddenly came back on, and I saw them all bow to... Me? Angelina, I've been looking forward to meeting you. I'm Nick Mason, Mr. Bruno's right-hand man. My dad sent you here? From this day on, you will become our new leader of the ex-organization, on his behalf. You gotta be kidding me! For so many years, he hasn't cared about whether we live or die, and now he suddenly wants me to take over? And look at you all. This organization seems no good. Please don't misunderstand us. X organization was founded by your father to help the local people and fight for justice. But things took a horrible turn, so I'm afraid he's gone to jail for a little while. He's in jail? Oh, my head! Fighting for justice? That's why he's in jail now? Your father put the safety of the seaport local first. In doing so, he fell into the enemy's trap. You will understand him better if you accept his wish and become our leader. As much as I hate to admit it, I missed my dad. He once promised that he would skip his work and hang out with me on my birthday, but then he just disappeared without a word and has been quiet for the past six years. Until now. Darling, I have something for you. She gave me some old letters and a plushy bear, which I'd begged my dad to buy for me. She'd hid it from me the whole time, as she was mad at my dad for always risking his life for things that weren't any of his business. It turned out that my dad had still cared about me, even without me knowing. Mom, I've made up my mind. I hope you'll support me. So, my mom and I had a long journey to the seaport of the city where my dad's ex-organization was secretly operating. We walked into the market, then stopped at a large fish shop. 
How on earth does an organization have their secret base in such a crowded place? The most dangerous place is the safest one. Remember that. I remembered my dad used to say this to me when I was a kid, too. This must be his crazy idea. Nick led me into a room at the back of the store and introduced this as the organization's base. So, this is where my dad used to work, and he'd still kept the same old hat all these years? Let's get to work. There's been a lot of theft going on in town lately. Every night, the thieves break into stores and steal everything they can. People are panicking right now, so we need to solve this as soon as possible. Isn't this the police's responsibility? If they were capable, we wouldn't have to get involved. That's why your father maintains this organization. Now you need to settle in a bit. I've arranged your accommodation and enrolled you in a local school. Remember, your identity is top secret. For the next few days, at 5 a.m. every morning, Uncle Nick got me up and took me to the port to tell me more about the thieves. However, he just joined the fish auction the whole morning instead of actually doing anything serious. So, I went somewhere else and pretended to talk to the fishmongers about the burglaries in town. At that moment, a guy in a cap that covered his face bumped into me. Hey, dude! Nice bracelet, but ever taught to apologize? Hey, hey, take it easy. You're making a scene. Okay... Maybe I should just behave like a normal schoolgirl here. Having to get up so early in the morning to go to the port also made me too exhausted to study anything. One morning I was falling asleep at my usual place when some noise woke me up. A group of gangsters was teasing a boy? Dude, I'm trying to catch some shut-eye over here. Shut up, loser. Uh-oh, they were messing with the wrong person. I grabbed a nearby mop and made some fancy moves that took them all down, then dragged the flabbergasted nerd out of there. He wasn't calm enough to run for his life. This little guy is Killian. Ever since that day, he kept following me and wouldn't shut up about how strong I was, saying things like, I could never imagine a small person like you having such crazy strength, or they all pick on me, but you, Angel, don't. Then let's be friends. I have no peace when he's around. While I was trying to make some space for myself, a call suddenly came from Uncle Nick. One of the jewelry shops in the city just got burglarized. Can you help? What? Yeah, I'll head back to headquarters and set up a plan. You can count on me. I then hung up, and that's when I heard a ball hitting the floor. I turned around, and there was Killian, standing behind me, shocked to the core. He'd obviously heard the whole conversation. If you utter a word of this to anyone, you'll not wake to see another day. Do you hear me? I... I can help you. I know this town like the back of my hand. Okay, we can be friends. Or associates. As long as you keep quiet. After school, Killian and I rushed to the crime scene. While wandering around, I spotted a shiny thing among the broken glass. It must have been from those thieves. But wait, I've seen this D symbol somewhere. I was about to pick it up when Killian grabbed my hand, shivering. Bro, it's her who attacked us back then. That gangster suddenly came at me. I tried to dodge him, but ended up toppling over backwards. Suddenly, a strong arm held me back and shielded me from the punch. Mamma mia! Who's this handsome hunk? I wrapped my arms around him and pulled out my inner damsel in distress. Oh, my hero! These jerks won't leave me alone! Please save me! I'm scared! Mess with my friend one more time and you're dead meat. Get lost! He turned to me, making sure I was okay, then parted way. Through Killian, I found out his name is Frank, a senior at our school, and he's known for his cold and reserved demeanor. Definitely my type of guy. But wait, what about the bracelet? I returned to the broken glass window. The bracelet was nowhere to be found. At school, all students were constantly talking about these recent burglaries. Everyone was worried about who would be the next victim. When will all this nonsense stop? I wonder who their next target will be. Don't you see? The recent victims were all the big shots in town, and the crimes were all on the days the police weren't out patrolling. So then, Graham's jewelry shop and Holden's boutique store could potentially be their next target? That makes sense! Uh, wait, Frank? Now that you're here, I feel so much safer. It'll probably be Holden's because Graham already added a new security system to his shop. Please stop fiddling with your hair like that. Good observation. The police don't patrol the port tonight, so they might make a move. So stay still inside, will you, sweetie? Aww, but his sweetie still got to watch hold and shop and catch the thieves red-handed tonight. An hour had already passed, but nothing had happened. Right at that moment, Nick received a phone call that Graham's shop had just been robbed. The thieves broke the security system and everything had been taken. 
Nick snapped at me for acting impulsively without having any clear evidence. But this felt so sketchy, though. Holden's store was way more vulnerable. It's like they knew we were waiting to ambush them here. A few days later, while I was patrolling around the shopping street, Killian informed me that there was a suspicious masked man sneaking around the pearl shop. I immediately dashed there, right at the moment he was breaking the lock. In the blink of an eye, I kicked him, knocking him to the ground. Angelina! Holy crickets, are you okay? I looked up to see Frank running towards me. The thief immediately rose up, causing me to fall back, then fled the scene right away. Catch the thief, quick! Frank and Killian darted past me and followed the guy. I waited for them at the harbor, but only Killian came back. Oh, sorry, Angelina, but I have to say this. There's something fishy about Frank. I think he's on the thief's side. Oh, come on. Are you jealous of him? How do I know you're not their spy? What do you mean? You've been acting suspicious from the get-go. You wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. And remember how you listened in on my conversation with Nick? And what about when you made me so sure it was Holden Shop that would be the next target, hmm? And now you're blaming Frank? You're so wrapped up in that jerk. I saw him purposefully let that thief go. When I was about to catch up to him, Frank suddenly stopped, making me crash into him. Then the thief got away. That, that can't be. He's always there to help me. I'm the one who's always backing you up, but you only see that fraud as your hero. Ugh, just forget it. Wait, I, I had no idea who to trust. It was all so confusing. Right at that moment, I got a message from Frank asking me to go to this meteor camping place as he had something important to say to me. Okay, it was time to confront him and get the truth. I rushed there as fast as I could, only to find... nobody? I looked around and noticed this suspiciously lit up tent. The tent flap suddenly opened, and a shadow bolted towards me. Hey, hey, calm down, it's me. I opened my eyes to see Frank in front of me. He'd set up this whole place for me? Frank suddenly took my hand and confessed. Angelina, I've fallen head over heels for you. I was wondering, will you be my girlfriend? Together, we could be a power couple. With your ex-organization and my Darkwalkers clan backing us, how do you know I'm related to ex-organization? Huh, <laughs> I've been watching you since that first day you wandered around the fish market with that old Nick. <laughs> Remember this bracelet? You almost got me that time. You, you shameless, rotten, stinking skunk! I even trusted you over Killian! Oh, come on. It's not my fault you fell for me and betrayed your best friend. You and I are more alike than you think. It's only fitting that we become a team. Enough! Listen carefully. I'm never going to team up with a dirtbag like you. H how did you- Guys, take her! From the tents, Frank's minions came out one by one and surrounded me, then gradually tightened the siege. Let's see who's the boss now. Oh, no, 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 I fell into his trap. Those punks held a rope, ready to tie me up, but right at that moment, I heard a car engine approaching. Is that Killian leading Nick and the X organization He jumped out of the car, ran past the minions and Frank to get to me. Angelina, are you alright? You're not hurt anywhere, are you? I shook my head and felt so touched. He'd come to save me. I thought you were mad at me. I was, a little bit, but I couldn't let you do all this alone, so I went to Uncle Nick. Behind Killian, Uncle Nick and the team had seized all the thieves and their ringleader Frank. Now they'd spill all their dirty secrets in front of the law. It turns out, my dad was about to expose the Darkwalker clan for their evil antics when they framed him for intentionally causing injury and put him behind bars. Since I became the new leader of X, Frank had been trying to seduce me so he could manipulate the organization. Finally, though, my dad was found innocent and released. Mom and I welcomed him home with open arms. I'm so sorry for leaving you behind. I was afraid I would put you in danger. It's all right, Dad. You must have had a hard time, too. I'm sorry for taking so long to realize how proud I am of you. I missed you so much. Dad was super impressed with what we had accomplished for the organization. He even decided to let me continue to be the leader, all the while supporting me and teaching me his tricks. And I know for sure everything will turn out okay, especially with this guy by my side. So, did I do a good job proving myself, lady boss? The vice leader position seems to suit me well, don't you think? Hmm, you do deserve a promotion. How does vice leader and boyfriend sound? Hey, I'm Sage, but you can call me Witch. 
That's what all the townspeople call me anyway. My folks run a funeral home called Black Rose, and some superstitious people consider this a bad omen. By some, I mean the entire town. Everything about us is spooky and weird. Want to see our house? It kind of has that monster house vibe and looks like a fort in the middle of this dollhouse neighborhood. I did try making friends with the other kids, but it never worked out. Ah! Don't eat the cookies! They're poisoned! Despite all that, Mom and Dad found their work meaningful and put a lot of effort into it. Well, maybe a little too much? I guess the reason why they're so emotional is because they know what it feels like to lose someone dear to them. My little sister Leah's missing, and it's all my fault. We'd searched for her everywhere for five years, but still, no news. It was a terrible time for my family, but instead of showing us support, the neighbors spread absurd rumors about Leah's disappearance. Some said the devil took her, while others said we sacrificed her during a satanic ritual. These heartless people were never going to change their minds about us, so I decided to just go along with it. This is why no one dares to bother me, as they don't want to be cursed- Ouch! Oh, sorry, miss. We're just trying to catch that bird. Please don't curse us. Jesus, that poor little thing. If you hurt an innocent creature again, I'll turn you into one and see how you like having stones shot at you. Blood drained immediately from their faces as they screamed and bolted. I carefully took the bird out of the bush, then brought it to my forest house. This is my secret hideout deep in the forest. I have my own garden where I plant herbs to heal injured animals. This isn't a wild bird. It even has a name. Must be someone's pet. Okay, Sky. so you like to sneak out, huh? The world out there is dangerous. I should bring you home. I followed the address on Skye's tag and took her there. Guess her owner wouldn't be happy if they thought a witch had cursed her, so it's better not to show myself. No one wants anything to do with a witch. But no matter how annoyed or scared they acted, I just don't care. Having the place to myself has its perks. But then out of the blue, a guy slumped on the chair opposite me. How dare he? I could feel his eyes peeking at me. Another idiot wanting to test his courage. Hey, Sage, right? We're in the same English literature class. But in case you didn't know, I'm Mark. Why should I know your name? Oh, I... I just wanted to... If you don't want to get diarrhea, sleep paralysis, or skin rashes, don't ever talk to me. Then I turned around to leave, but tripped over something and fell forward. You alright? This is crazy. Who asked him to do that? Then I came home to find an angry crowd in front of my house. Those eerie sounds are keeping us awake at night. What kind of dark magic are you practicing? Your black sorcery made my curling iron overheat and burn my hair. Must be some demonic influence messing around here. Turns out, strange things were happening to every house in the neighborhood. So these superstitious people blamed everything on my family and even wanted to kick us out. We can't move. We have to wait here. For Leah. She's with the devil now. She's obviously not coming back. So go away. Never talk about my sister like that again. Get out of here. Coincidentally, there was a loud rumble of thunder right at that moment. Horrified, they started pointing and calling me a witch. Go home, everyone, for your own safety. I'll take it from here. This man is Mr. Thompson, the town's mayor. He came with an offer to help our family move away in peace. Believe me, it's best for everyone. If and when your daughter comes back, you'll be informed right away. After he left, my parents seemed to be thinking about moving away for real. What's gotten into them? We didn't do anything wrong. Why do we have to leave? I'm not going anywhere. My parents might be weak, but I'm not. I'll wait for my sister here. She promised me she'd help me care for those poor creatures. She will be back. Achoo! What was that? It sounds like a guy's sneeze? Who's there? Show yourself. Ugh, you idiot. Come out alone. Both of you. Now. Those two look familiar. Right, they're Meg and Nick, the infamous best friend duo in my school. It turns out, they were curious about the strange phenomena happening at Meg's house too. They wanted to see if I was really using witchcraft to cause all that. We didn't expect to see you healing animals here. Why do you let people think you're a witch? They can call me a witch, an alien, or whatever. I don't care, as long as they leave me be. I hate it when people annoy me, which is what you two are doing now. Quit following me and never come here again but they didn't leave. Instead, Meg told me about a black rose that always appeared at the scene. Of course, it reminds the townsfolk of my family. Nick thought that made no sense. I mean, if it really was us, why would we make it that obvious? Hmm, someone's clearly trying to frame us. That's it. 
If I found that person, my family could live here in peace again. We'll investigate together. We can catch the bad guy and be heroes, like a detective squad. Sounds like you've been watching too much Scooby-Doo. And why aren't you guys scared of me? Actually, I'd make a great Daphne. And come on, we just saw you feeding the cats. Even if you are a witch, then you must be a kind one. The next day, I was going downstairs when I heard some chattering noise. Are those angry townsfolk back? I was about to scare them away, but I saw my parents warmly welcoming Meg and Nick? This is the first time I'd had friends come over, so my parents were overreacting. I hurriedly pulled my so-called friends out of the house. I guess disturbing me has become a habit to you, huh? We didn't know how else to contact you. Anyway, we'd like to introduce you to an IT expert. He's agreed to help us. Then suddenly, a guy standing behind the black rose bush appeared and said hi to me. Isn't that the guy from the library? This is Mark, the newest member of our squad. Good to see you again. I hope you'll remember my name this time. So, this Mark guy was really serious about this. He's now telling Nick how he could get data from all of the cameras in the neighborhood, which sounded like some kind of alien language to me. Look, our tech genius found something. Mark is awesome, right, Sage? Um, I guess? Um, someone hacked into these houses' networks and was causing their electrical appliances to go haywire. And every night at 11 o'clock sharp, the camera would be disconnected. Not for long, just enough for someone to place a black rose at the scene unnoticed. Can you track down that hacker's IP address? Yes, and also their coordinates. That's Clara's house? Wait, Clara? The drama queen who always plays up everything about me? Does she hate me that much to target my whole family? We reached out to Clara to talk privately, but she flat out denied everything. What is wrong with you? Did this witch hypnotize you into becoming her slave? Blink twice if you need help. <laughs> we have proof. You can't get away with this. Are you threatening me? This is illegal. I will tell my father about this. You think you're a big deal just because your father is the mayor? Big enough for you to watch out. She's the mayor's daughter? What's with that smug attitude? Everyone in this school remembers how she embarrassed herself last year after Mark rejected her. You may not know this, but Mark is the most popular guy among the girls in our school. Eh, um, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in those girls. You don't have to explain yourself to me. I don't even care. The atmosphere suddenly became weirdly awkward. Well, now the only way is to stalk Clara and catch her red-handed. But we've been sitting here for an hour and nothing's happened. This snooping scheme is so silly. I was about to leave when Mark stopped me. Someone was coming out of Clara's house. Gotcha. Still trying to deny it now, Clara? Mark took off his mask, but who's this man? He suddenly flung out, then attacked Mark and ran off. We were about to chase him when Mark cried out in pain. Meg and Nick told me to take Mark home while they chased after the guy. I brought him home. Hmm, this house looks so familiar. Oh, this was the owner's house of Skye, the bird I'd saved. Mark explained he'd seen me bring Skye back and was impressed with the note I'd left on how to take care of its wound. I knew everyone had been wrong about you, so I wanted to thank you and be your friend. I'm not someone who could make friends. Then I quickly left. The next day, Mark helped us arrange a meeting with Clara at the cafe where he worked. When Clara heard about the man coming out of her house last night, she seemed shaken and said he was probably one of her dad's staff. However, when Meg asked her for her help, Clara refused. We hit a dead end again, but Mark said he already had a solution. Before he could tell us, the cafe owner appeared and told me that spooky stuff was happening and asked me to leave. The holy statue, the town's symbol, was broken, and they found another black rose at the scene. Meg and Nick immediately jumped to my defense, but he didn't listen. He also forbade Mark from hanging out with me, or else he'd fire him. I'll leave now! See? I'm not good at making friends. I only bring them trouble. I dashed away so no one could see me cry. However, suddenly, someone's hand grabbed mine, then pulled me onto the bus just as it arrived at its stop. Mark? What are you doing? He'll fire you! I quit. That kind of boss doesn't get to fire me. It's all my fault. Don't worry. I have a ton of different jobs. Waiter, dog walker, even babysitter. Anything that makes money. What's the money for? This bus will take you to the answer. We got off at the last stop. An orphanage. So Mark was donating the money he earned to these orphans. Promise me you'll show them your true kind side. At first, I wasn't sure if I could, but then I gradually opened up to these sweet kids. Suddenly, I saw a familiar figure watching other children having fun from afar. Is that... Leah? My sister? 
Turns out, five years ago, a lost kid was found wandering by the bus stop. She was so scared that she couldn't remember anything about her family. She only said a few separate words like funeral or dead people, so the nuns thought her parents had passed away and took her in. During her time here, she couldn't blend in with other kids. Seeing how Leah pushes others away, I saw myself in her. She shouldn't live her life the same way I do. I then called my parents and they came to pick us up right away. Oh boy, it surely was the tearful reunion of the century. Thank you so much. We only found Leah thanks to you. I'm glad to help. But that's not all. I've got something else to show you. As it turned out, Mark bugged Clara's phone at the cafe. It recorded a call she had with her father, exposing him as the culprit behind the town's mishaps. It appears Mr. Mayor wanted to build a shopping mall, but he needed to clear up some space for it. Using my family's bad rap, he played spooky tricks on the townspeople to scare them into selling their homes for cheap. When Clara found out the truth, she begged her father to stop, but he refused to. Meg and Nick posted the recording on the internet, causing outrage among our town. The cops arrested him, and my family's name was cleared. All our neighbors apologized to my family for letting their superstitions blindside them. My parents were obviously touched, so they forgave them all, and threw a party. So, my family was reunited. Not only did I find my sister, but also three good friends. Well, maybe two good friends, and one more than just a friend. Oh God! Can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? According to the poet, this world and all existing life is an illusion of sorts. As reality doesn't exist, philosophers refer to it as dream argument and dream hypothesis. What? What an interesting lesson! By the way, Look at how there's a ray of sunshine coming through the curtains. That's so pretty. This kind of weather indeed puts you in such a dreamy mood, huh? Yeah, right. But remember, there is no rose without thorns. That sunshine may look glorious, but it will harm your eyes. Yeah, I know. The maids always tell me that sunlight is the enemy for me. For my beautiful, sensitive blue eyes. Looking at it once, and I'll never be able to see anything again. That's why I've never been allowed to leave this castle. My maids all look identical in those masks, don't they? When I was a child, of course, I once got curious, and I pulled one of them off. As punishment, I was denied dessert for a whole week. And worse still, it wasn't worth it, as the maid's face was exceedingly ordinary. The masks looked far better. Anyway, I suppose all that matters is that they take great care of me. Each day they bring me food, water, and new clothes. I was sipping my leek and potato soup when I heard a scream. Let me out! Curious, I went and hid in a corner and saw two maids attempting to lock the screaming girl into a room. Hmm, I've never seen that girl in this castle before. I wonder if she's from the outside world. Poor her. It looks like she can't control herself. The world out there is scary. Perhaps it has sent her into madness. It's much safer here in the castle. I can play all day, paint, knit, and read. Oh, how peaceful. Hmm. But I still couldn't stop thinking about that poor girl. I wonder what will happen to her. The screaming didn't stop and my curiosity got the best of me, so I snuck into the girl's room. Shh, stop screaming. No one is listening. Uh, who are you? Uh, um, my name is Mistress. What's yours? <laughs> Mistress isn't a name. Are you stupid? It's just a name. Everybody here calls me that. This girl was so stubborn. She seemed to be wary of everything. Poor little outside world girl. After much persistence, she told me that her name was Nora. I was about to ask her why she was here, when suddenly two maids appeared and dragged me away. Mistress, you should not interact with this wicked girl, and you mustn't be late for your embroidery class. <sighs> it was nice to finally get to talk to a girl my own age, and I must admit that given her brash nature, 
I found Nora rather interesting. During class, I kept thinking about how I could sneak out and see her again. Ah! Ouch! That annoying girl screaming made me prick my finger. I ran out to check on her, but the maids immediately blocked my way. Perhaps I could talk some sense into her. Trust me, the last time I spoke to her, she was acting totally normal. The desperate maids exchanged looks, then let me go to her. As predicted, when I approached Nora, she stopped screaming. Hey, it's Ariana. That's my real name. Screaming never works here. Just pretend you're listening to my words, then I'll help you out. The maids were quite surprised when Nora immediately calmed herself down and showed signs of following directions, so they let us be and left. We began to chat, and ever since then, the maids let me see Nora every day. She told me how before her mother died, she gave Nora an address to find her biological father, who she'd never met before. Nora's grandma helped her set up a meeting with him and took her to the meeting point. She was so nervous, but happy at the same time to finally meet her dad. And at first, he was as kind and charming as she imagined. But then unexpectedly, right after they said goodbye to her grandma, he brought Nora here and let those masked people lock her up. But you're fortunate to be here, as it's safe. No, it's not. That's just what they want you to believe. Then Nora told me about the outside world, about her friends, school, and shopping malls. Every day, she even drew me paintings of the outside world, of beautiful memories with her family, her mom who passed away, and also her dad, even though she only met him once. Family? What is that? All I'd ever known were the faceless maids. The next day when I visited Nora as usual, she suddenly told me, Sis, we need to get out of here. What do you mean? This is my home. No, it's not. It's a prison. Who on earth stays inside for 14 years, huh? It's because of my eyes. I'll go blind if I go out there. My maids only want the best for me. That's why they keep me here. Are you crazy? You've been tricked. Just think about it. Do you know who gave birth to you? And why did that person leave you with these people? Or are these people the ones who took you away from your mom? Don't you want to find out the truth? This was my home, wasn't it? But thinking about what Nora just said, as well as the outside world that she rambled about every day, I suppose it would be interesting to experience it for myself. I'd just have to try my best to protect my eyes. So, I snuck into the housekeeper's room and stole the front door key. As we approached the main hall leading to the door, we saw a masked woman standing by a man. In his arms was a young girl, deep asleep. H huh? Th that's my dad. What? Did he come to pick you up or something? Don't you see that they're all in the same boat? And she's the ringleader. I peered closer at them and spotted the masked woman's silver hair and luxurious dress. Isn't that my tester? She lives in the grand suite and visits me weekly to assess my learning and etiquette. Mom, how are you going to handle this case? Just leave her in the empty room at the end of the hallway. As for Nora, I think she'll settle in properly in a week or so. Then we can start her etiquette and culture lessons. Which Nora? Ah, I remember. Besides, you should restrict yourself a bit. Ariana, Nora, and now this child? Don't let the list of your illegitimate children be as long as your arm. Then you can just throw them away somewhere. Why bother raising them? They are my grandchildren, after all. They can't end up like those street rats. And who knows? They may become useful. But this has to be the last one. We can't risk Laura finding out about us. It would ruin our family's affluent name. Do you understand? I know. But fear not as my wife is kind and foolish. She is completely clueless to these matters, thanks to your smart move. So, we were this heartless man's illegitimate children? 
and because of his deceit, he was forcing us to live in darkness? I don't want to be locked up and lied to any longer. We needed to escape. From then on, Nora kept her act up and behaved like an angel, which eventually led to us being allowed to study together. And today is the day. Oriana is having a convulsion! We must take her to the hospital as soon as possible! However, the maids called the doctor to come round here instead. No! The plan was to escape when we were taken outside. If the doctor came here, he'd discover that my rashes were painted on and our plan would be disclosed. Okay, plan B. I was still lying on the bed playing the whole role of a patient, while Nora locked the door of the room and went to the bathroom screaming. Help! There's a giant spider in here! As expected, the doctor went to check. The Nora immediately locked him in. Then we quickly took the knotted string made of the fabrics and embroidery class out from under the bed and then escaped through the window. Ah! I got my head between my hands as soon as I landed. I didn't expect it to be so bright outside. It's burning my eyes, Nora! What? There's no time for your hysterics. You'll be done if you're stuck here anyway. Just open your eyes and run! Hurry up! But I'm scared! Huh? Nothing happened. My eyes seemed fine. But no time to celebrate as then I saw... Oh my god. A couple of maids were chasing after me. Nora pulled my hand and ran towards the garden. Fortunately, we were already out of their sight when... Woof! Woof! A huge hound appeared out of nowhere and growled at us. I crouched down in a bush and watched Nora wave the dog closer, and then pat him. What? Magic! The dog suddenly became unusually obedient and led us to a secret place. A dog-sized passageway! I hesitated, but seeing the maids gaining on us, I reluctantly squeezed through it real quick. I can't believe I'm putting my destiny in the hands of this reckless girl! She said we had to get to her grandmother's house right away for help. What are those things running back and forth on the road? Why are they making that loud, annoying noise? Hmm. And why is Nora waving her arms about? Did she want them to stop? Too bad nobody did, as she's no princess. We kept wandering until we saw something which Nora called a truck parked on the roadside. She rushed over, then helped me onto the back of it. Oh, it was full of bananas. I stuffed my mouth full of them to ward off my starvation, while the scenery kept changing. That thing stopped, and we immediately got off before getting caught. I held her tight, frightened of all the people around us. They kept staring at me. And what kind of style was that? They all looked very peculiar. Maybe they were just commoners. Then we used our power to demand a man to take us to Nora's grandma's. Oh, it was exhausting. What? The outside is actually beautiful, sparkling with all those lights. And there are exhibitions of everything in the world, such as food, toys, flowers, and even creatures. Yes, everything. But the most important thing was that my eyes didn't get sore looking at those shiny things. At all! Nora's grandma seems kind, but her home is full of the strangest of items. While Nora told her what had happened, I found myself bewitched by the talking black box on the wall. Suddenly, Nora's grandma led us to her far smaller truck and took us to somewhere called the Cops. They all wore these same funny outfits and bombarded us with dozens of confusing questions. And what exactly is an ID card? A few days later, there was news that the cops had caught my so-called dad, grandma, and maids also. As predicted, he was a womanizer. So when his lovers asked him to support his children, he was so afraid that his wife would find out that he took these children and locked them away in the castle. They're currently awaiting something called a trial which Nora says is where bad people get their comeuppance. Whoa, the world outside is so busy. I didn't realize there'd be so many unmasked faces. 
and that strange talking box still startles me, especially when someone is holding a weapon. Nora says when I've adjusted to my new life a little more, I'll start school with her, and one day I'll even learn how to drive one of those smaller trucks. But firstly, she's teaching me how to dress like other people do, and use this brick to communicate with them. This world is puzzling, but I'm sure with Nora's help, I'll soon find my feet, even if it's just so I can learn how to reply to my dashing neighbor. Emma, your teacher, Mrs. Holm, called again. She said your grades are appalling and you don't pay attention in class. Why can't you be more like your sister? Yawn. Not this speech again. It's been like this ever since I started elementary school. In my mom's eyes, only my sister, Evelyn, inherited our dad's intelligence. While I'm just the senseless member of the family. Ugh, as if. She's only good with useless books. Bet she doesn't know anything practical. Like how dad's ethernet company works and such. But whatever, I don't care. I'm full, I announced as I got up and went to my little headquarters, the garage. I was busy working on my own personal project, so I didn't have time to give a hoot about who my mom's favorite child is. Oh, you must be wondering what I'm working on. Well, this device broadcasts Wi-Fi. Sounds familiar, right? But my device is able to broadcast across the entire city. Not only that, the connection is stronger and much more stable than the Wi-Fi people use at home. And it's more convenient without all the cables and stuff. This is without a doubt my proudest work ever. And what a coincidence that a few days earlier at school, Mrs. Holm announced that for the first time, the school was organizing an invention contest. Normally, I give school activities a miss. But this time was different. This contest could be fun, right? There was no time to waste, so I put all my spare time, day and night, into making my invention contest ready. And you won't believe what happened. I won first prize. And that's not all. One of the judges, Mr. Johnson, was so interested in my invention that he offered to invest in it. At first, I was kind of scared and hesitated to agree because, I mean, I was still in high school. But this was an opportunity of a lifetime. So how could I deny it, right? So after that... Mr. Johnson sorted out a manufacturing company and office space for me downtown. This is cool, but I prefer to work in my garage. It's just more convenient that way, with me still being at school and all. I upgraded my device and launched it to the public. And you know what? It was a huge success. Pretty much everybody in the city got rid of their old, laggy Wi-Fi devices and accessed mine. Then one day, I got a call from the local news channel asking to interview me and my family at home. Oh my god, yes! Oh, there's just one snag. I hadn't told my family about it yet because, um, I don't know, maybe I just know there's no way they'd believe me? Like the time I got an A in my physics exam and my mom instantly asked if I cheated. But, well, whatever. This is much bigger than that. So I quickly ran downstairs to the living room and excitedly told my family that the invention benefiting the town was mine. But Mum and Evelyn burst out laughing. So you're telling me that this Wi-Fi, which is broadcasting across the entire city, is your invention? Yeah, Mum, it's mine. Then Mum and Evelyn laughed even louder. Honey, it's bad enough you're failing at school. Please don't start lying. Ugh. Forget about it. Why did I even try? Then, the morning after, when the doorbell rang, my mom opened it and saw a reporter and a cameraman. She couldn't believe her eyes. Mom and Evelyn exchanged panicked looks, then rushed upstairs to prepare. It was so hilarious. <laughs> the hysterics continued as they interviewed my parents. I watched my nervous, sweaty dad stand there like an awkward statue. Well, Mom began bragging about me like, As soon as Emma was born, I knew she was a genius like her dad. I always encourage her to pursue her dreams. Jeez, and the Oscar goes to my mom. I didn't know she could act that well. To be honest, since I could remember, 
Mom never said anything nice about me. Ever. But now that she knew I was the mastermind behind the town's Wi-Fi, she would probably treat me differently. Right? Wrong. Then one night I came downstairs for a glass of milk and overheard Mom and Dad talking in the living room. Emma is such a selfish child. How badly will this affect your business? The truth is, the company's going through tough times. But don't worry, we're trying everything we can. Huh? Did I do something? And what's wrong with Dad's company? I tried to eavesdrop more, but suddenly I heard my dad standing up from the couch, so I quickly ran upstairs to my room. The next day, Dad forgot to take his lunch with him to work, so Mom asked me to take it over. But when I got to his company floor, it was deserted. Huh? Where was everybody? Did everybody get a day off or something? But that couldn't be it, right? That evening, over dinner, I asked Dad. I went to your office at midday, but not a single person was there. What's going on? Mom suddenly put her cutlery down and gave Dad a shocked look. Is what Emma just said true? Dad lowered his head and sighed out. Yes, it's true. I temporarily shut the company last week. I didn't want you all to worry, so I didn't tell you. I'm sorry. What? How could you? You said you would fix it. That's when it hit me. But I deeply prayed it wasn't the truth. So I asked him, is it because of my device? Dad didn't answer me. He just glared sadly down at his dinner. But I knew what his silence meant. I was right. Suddenly, Evelyn stood up and screamed in my face. It's all your fault. You invented that stupid device, and now Dad's business is at stake. That's so typical of you. You never think before you act. Then she stomped off upstairs. I just sat there speechless. I just wanted my family to be proud of me, but instead, it seemed like they despised me more than ever. Then Dad turned to me and softly said, Emma, this isn't your fault. I was kind of waiting for my mom to say something, anything at all, but she didn't. She just cleaned up the table. I felt really bad about what happened to Dad. But hey, now I had to work even harder so I could provide for my family, right? After that, Mom completely ghosted me. <sighs> As for my sister, whenever our paths crossed, she gave me a dagger look and muttered out mean comments like, Let's see how long it takes for your precious business to fail. I tried to ignore her, but then she took it too far. One Sunday, I was in my garage working away, when suddenly I heard loud noises coming from outside. I opened the garage door to see a crowd of people holding signs saying, We lost our jobs because of you, and no job, no future. My god, they were protesters. I think they were from my dad's office. Wait a minute, I spotted a familiar face. Evelyn? She was holding a big sign saying, my dad lost his job because of you. Eventually, dad came out and dispersed the crowd. Then he called an emergency family meeting. How could you do that to me? The correct question would be how could you do that to dad? Thanks to you, dozens of people have lost their jobs? You're making people's lives miserable. Enough, both of you. Evelyn, what you did was wrong. Families are supposed to support each other. But Dad, she- Didn't you just hear what I said? Evelyn gave me a dirty look, then she ran off to her room. I looked at Mom, who was leaning against the wall with her arms folded. Did she agree with what Evelyn did? Or was she on my side? My God, please say something. But to my surprise, after that, my mother started talking to me again, and she was actually being nice. She even started cleaning my room and workspace. Whoa, this was new? Had she finally accepted me? Then one day, I received tons of emails complaining about my Wi-Fi. It took me all day, but I finally found the cause of the problem. My laptop. Somebody had tampered with it. It didn't take a genius to figure out who it was. Evelyn, duh. But I needed proof so I set up a trap. The next evening, when everybody was having dinner, I ran downstairs, 
quickly grabbed a piece of bread and said, I need to go run some errands. Oh, and can you please stay out of the garage as I'm uploading some important files? Mum and Dad nodded and smiled at me. Evelyn, on the other hand, just rolled her eyes and continued eating. Well, at least I knew my plan was in motion. I walked outside and hid behind the bushes. So, what's my plan, you ask? Well, I set up my laptop so that when anyone opened it, it would automatically send a notification to my phone and turn on the camera so I could see who it was. I waited for an hour, but still nothing. Then suddenly, my phone beeped. Somebody was opening my laptop. They hadn't switched the light on yet, so it was too dark to see them but I was 100% sure who it was. Time to expose. What are you doing sneaking out here? Evelyn? What was she doing out here? Wait, if Evelyn was here, then who was it in the garage? Not answering Evelyn's question, I ran like crazy into the garage to capture this intruder. And as soon as I turned on the lights, I couldn't believe who was messing with my laptop. It was... Mom! What on earth was going on? I called a family meeting and told everyone what Mum did. Dad and Evelyn looked shocked and asked Mum why she did it. I just couldn't stand seeing your dad suffer anymore. He put his life into that company, and now he's just a laughing stock. Do you realize our neighbors and relatives have been gossiping about him? They think it's so pitiful that he lost out to his own daughter. So I did what any self-respecting wife would do. Was she serious? Why didn't she just talk to me? All I ever wanted was for her to talk to me. Nothing else. But no, she decided to go behind my back and try to sabotage my business instead. After her betrayal, I'd had enough. So I didn't speak to her and avoided her as much as possible. It was one thing for mom to be cold towards me but I never thought she was capable of doing this. This went on for weeks, and it got kinda tedious. Trust me, it's no fun trying to avoid someone in your own home. But then one day, I arrived back from school and saw Dad sitting in a corner in the living room, repairing his PC. Jeez, he looked so miserable. That's when the truth hit me. This was his passion, and I took it away from him. Suddenly, I understood why Mum did what she did. She saw how disheartened he was, but knew he'd never say anything to me, because he's always supportive. But how can I fix everything? Should I give everything up so that my dad can reopen his company again? Ugh, why was this so hard to figure out? Wait a minute. I think I have the solution. You must be wondering what my dad was doing here. Well... I came up with the idea that we should work together. My dad's a pro with technology, so it didn't take long to show him how things work around here. Oh, and since my business has grown, we were able to employ some of his former work employees too. With dad around to help, I have time to focus on my studies. Even Evelyn started helping out, and she was so good at it, I made her dad's assistant. Talk about a proper family business, ha! As for mom, we had a really long talk. I finally told her how awful her attitude towards me made me feel, and she apologized for everything she had done. I eventually forgave her. I knew she did that just because she loves Dad very much. So, after all that drama, we're now just one big happy family. <laughs> yeah, here's another load of bills to add to the pile. Oh, hey, I'm Zoe. A recent graduate turned office worker with a lousy wage. I could barely afford to pay for food and rent, let alone think about my college debt. It wouldn't matter so much if it was just me, as I could live off of noodle soup. But I also had Birdie to think about, my little sister. Oh, she's back from school. Zoe, I found Daddy today! Huh? I looked at her with a wry smile. Actually, this was nothing new. You see, our parents died when Birdie was just a toddler, so now she longed to have parents just like her friends did. She often said to me, Zoe, you're like my mommy, but Clara and Polly have daddies too, and I want one. She was so innocent that whenever she saw a friendly-looking man on the street, she'd ask me, is that my daddy? <laughs> 
Come on, come here. How was school today? Daddy is very handsome, and he lives in a big house. Come on, I'll take you to him. Oh, my lord. This wasn't a house. It was a mansion. Confused, I was about to question Bertie on this, but she started ringing the bell repeatedly. Before I could stop her, someone who appeared to be the butler came out and happily let us inside without questioning anything. That's odd. I sipped on my iced tea and peered around at the grandness of the place, absorbing the rich energy, when suddenly, a very dashing guy walked over. There he is! That's Daddy! Huh? This was so confusing, and seeing her hug a stranger was super embarrassing. I had a talk with the guy to figure out what happened, and apparently he's called Harry, and he's 22 like me. Huh? That's crazy as he looks and acts way older. As for the dad story, it turns out as Bertie was waiting for the school bus, she saw a woman drop her purse. So she rushed over and picked it up and was about to return it, but the woman turned around, saw Bertie holding it, and accused her of being a thief. Just in time, Harry appeared and claimed to be her father to settle the matter. Then he took her to the mansion and showed her around. So that's what happened. Oh, my sister. Bertie has told me everything. She's such a precious child. I'd happily adopt her. No way! Why not? You like being here, don't you, Bertie? Zoe, I really like it here. I can play with Oreo as much as I want. And now, I have a daddy just like Clara and Polly do. But I can't just leave her alone? Of course not. You can stay with Bertie. (laughs) What? How come such a good person suddenly fell from the sky? Skeptical, I told Harry I needed more time to think. He smiled and handed me his business card and told me to call him any time. What is this? Harry Atkins, the eldest son of the chairman of ATLAC Corp? Unbelievable! His name was all over the internet as a rich and educated young man. If that was the case, then surely this had to be legit right? (sighs) I can't afford to pay these. My sister and I deserve better than this life. Besides, it would be nice to have a place to stay for free, right? So the next day, I went to see Harry and offered to help with the housework as payment. Harry agreed and presented a prepared contract. Contract? Okay, but there was a clause in it that required me not to mention that I was Bertie's sister. Hmm, this was a little odd. But never mind, it didn't matter. Here was to our new luxurious life. Wait, but does that mean I also have to call him dad? (laughs) So, yeah, my new life began. And oh boy, it was crazy. A maid brought me breakfast in bed and did all my laundry. So much for helping out with household chores. There are actually more servants in this house than the number of staff in my office so it's obvious that there's nothing left for me to do. Even so, I wanted to be useful, because hearing them calling me Miss made me feel quite embarrassed. However, oops, turns out I suck at house chores. Once I put Harry's fine suit in the washing machine and ended up ruining it, which made him pace up and down the room in anger. Also, he couldn't seem to say anything nice about me, always complaining about the flowers I bought or saying the muffins I spent hours baking were too chewy. He threw away all of my handmade stuff because he thought it was garbage. What a rude man. Oh, wait, he's not even a man. He's just a stubborn kid who doesn't care about other people's feelings. I tell ya, if it weren't for Bertie and that contract, I'd... Poof! But those are just small gripes. In general, our life here was great. Bertie is very happy, and seeing her living her best life makes me smile. But unbeknown to me, turns out this was the calm before the hurricane. Hurricane Rachel! Harry's betrothed fiancé since childhood, she's from a rich family and is therefore deemed a suitable marriage alliance to Harry's family. I overheard the servants in the house saying that Harry is the successor to the company. So when he marries Rachel, the company will be even more flourishing. As soon as she saw me, Rachel kept asking Harry, Hey, who is this? Why is she here? And this girl too. Why is there a kid in the house? Who is this scary lady? Hearing that, 
Rachel looked at me from head to toe and then started firing questions at me. Why are you here? How do you know Harry? When are you leaving? Enough! What a relief. Harry intervened just in time, then dragged her into the reading room. Rachel followed Harry, but didn't forget to wrap her arms around his neck as she peered at me with a smug look on her face. Huh? What does she mean by that? Ugh, is she... jealous? If that's the case, then she's wasting her time. Because it is true that I have a crush on someone, but it's not Harry. You see, the other week I was wandering home from the grocery store when I met the love of my life. My shopping bag split, and my soda, cookies, and potato chips tumbled out. I was trying to pick everything up without getting run over, when suddenly a guy appeared and helped me. Then he drove me home. His name's Marcus, and he's so hot. After that, we exchanged numbers, and have been texting ever since. Marcus is so easy to talk to, so I confided in him about everything, from Birdie being adopted to the fact that I'm now working as a housekeeper. He's so sweet and kind, and I feel like I can tell him anything. He's the prince of my dreams. Anyway, my strange life in the mansion continued. One thing's for sure, Harry was great with Bertie. For her birthday, he surprised her with a trip to the amusement park. I have to admit, we had a lot of fun together. Bertie made us go on the carousel five times. Then we got ice cream. Suddenly, I noticed Harry giving me this odd look. What? You have some ice cream on your lips. Here. He leaned forward and gently dabbed it away with a napkin. Just then, a crowd rushed in and Harry reached out and pulled me and Bertie closer to him. Our eyes met, and... Huh? Why did I have goosebumps and a pounding heart? What did that mean? Did he do that intentionally or not? Why did I have this strange feeling? While I was still sinking deep in my thoughts, Harry stopped the car and said he needed to pass by his brother's place for some files. Huh? Isn't that... Marcus? Marcus? I blurted out. You two know each other? I didn't answer. Instead, I turned my attention to Bertie. When we got home, I kept wondering why Marcus never told me who he was. I texted him to ask, and he replied that they don't get along, so he didn't want me to know. Hmm. Despite all that, I stayed up all night thinking about Marcus. And, and, um, also Harry. It's safe to say I was confused about everything. Then, Marcus and Rachel suddenly showed up at Harry's house one day with a load of groceries. Rachel announced that she was baking a cake, as it's soon going to be her birthday, and we should all assist. Okay, weird, but whatever. I was preparing the mixture when Marcus took my stirring hand and insisted on helping me. Suddenly, Harry burst in between us. Upon seeing this... Rachel yanked on his arm and pulled him away. My eyes widened in horror as I saw the mixture fly into the air and slow-mo splatter all over us. We stood there covered in cake mixture as we all exchanged dirty looks. Um, okay, so after that little display, I think it's clear to say that Harry has feelings for me. Later on, when Marcus and Rachel had left and I was freshly showered, Harry knocked on my door and smiling at me said, Zoe, there's a family dinner tomorrow where you'll get to meet my parents. Don't worry, you won't have to say anything. As a way of saying thanks, I'll pay off your college debts. Okay, so that was weird, but at this point, I'd learned not to question it anymore. Besides, it would be so nice to be debt-free, and it was just dinner, right? I want to break off the engagement with Rachel. This is my girlfriend, and we already have a kid together. Wh what I almost blurted out, but Harry squeezed my hand to stop me from saying anything, so I sat there with a dumbfounded look on my face. Right at that moment, Marcus and Rachel burst in. Stop the act! Mom, Dad, this isn't his girlfriend, and that little girl is actually her sister. She's just some poor maid. Yes, that's right. I've known all along. I'm the one who told Marcus to pretend to like you to get proof. Wh what is all this? Mom, Dad, I don't think a liar like him should be the heir of your company. I hope you rethink your decision. 
I didn't understand. What's going on here? Girlfriend? My child who? The heir of what? I just knew one thing only, that I was fooled by both my crush and Harry. I felt like such an idiot. So I quickly grabbed Bertie, packed up all my stuff, then ran out of that mansion immediately. Poor innocent Bertie seemed so confused. She kept asking where her daddy was and why she couldn't stay with him. I took what was left of our savings to rent a small apartment for both of us. Life went back to normal. Final demand letters and all. This was our reality. I knew that now. The last two months were like a dream. It was time to wake up. But still, I felt a pang of sadness whenever I thought about how Harry had fooled me. I was snooping around online and saw an article about how Marcus had taken over the company, only to end up bankrupt due to his poor decision-making. As for Harry, well, he'd founded his own startup, and it seemed to be doing pretty well. But then, one sunny day, I was on my way to pick up Bertie from school when a familiar person walked alongside me. Hey, it's a nice day, isn't it? Harry? What do you want? Look, I admit that at first, I was just using you to get out of my engagement with Rachel. But then, I... I... I want you and Bertie in my life. I love you, Zoe. Please come home with me. Ah... Now, what better way is there to spend a Saturday afternoon than lying on the couch watching a feel-good movie with lots of snacks? Ugh, I suppose I better get that. O-M-G. Who is this? He's the most gorgeous boy I've ever seen in my life! I stared at him in open-mouthed amazement, but then I saw him gazing back at me and realized I needed to say something. Hey, how may I help you? Hi, I'm Jaden. My mum and I have just moved in next door. Oh, in that case, welcome to the neighborhood. Jaden smiled as he held a box out to me. W was this a gift for me? Already? I took it from him and blushed out a thanks. I opened the box and saw that it was full of delicious-looking cookies. My mom baked them. She finds that people tend to be far more welcoming when it involves cookies. We chatted for a bit longer. Then he said he had to go and help his mom unpack. Aw, why did this moment have to end already? The next day at school, I couldn't wait to find my bestie Stella and tell her about my drop-dead gorgeous neighbor. But as it happens, she found me at my locker and immediately started gushing about this hot new boy. Hmm. I needed to see how handsome this guy was. My chance came at lunchtime when Stella pointed over at the new boy who was currently being pestered by Anna, this stuck-up girl from class. I squinted my eyes. O-M-G. The hot new boy was none other than Jaden. I watched on as Anna fluttered her eyelashes at him, then flicked her hair behind her back. Ugh. She needed to give the flirting a break. It was so tragic. Suddenly, Jaden saw me, smiled, then hurried over to me. Hi, Laura. Oh boy, am I glad to see you. He leaned in close to my ear and whispered, That girl is kind of freaking me out. Please, can we get out of here? Then to my surprise, he took my hand and led me away. I could see the shocked look on Anna's face, and I couldn't help but smirk back at her. <laughs> Take that, Anna. He's holding my hand, not yours. Then after school, Jaden and I walked home together. Turns out, as well as being the hottest guy on the planet, he was also really sweet and funny. <sighs> Back home, I saw Jaden's mom, Cynthia, watering her window box. On seeing us, she waved us over, then insisted on inviting me inside for homemade lemonade. We all got on so well. Looks like I'm going to have a boyfriend soon, one whose mom loves me. <laughs> From then onward, Jaden and I hung out lots. We had lunch together, we went to the library together, and always walked home together. I was pretty sure the girls at school were super jealous, 
especially Anna. One day, during P.E., the teacher told us we were playing dodgeball and assorted us into two teams. Anna, who was on the opposite side, wouldn't quit aiming at me. I tried my best to dodge her throws, but bang! She got me! Now, listen to me. Guys like Jaden don't like ordinary girls like you. He's mine, so quit chasing him. Furious, I yelled. I'm not chasing him. He's already my boyfriend. Um, actually not. Yet I was pretty sure Jaden liked me too. Just you wait. He'll soon tire of you and come running to me. Ugh, Anna was so annoying. I needed to get my frustrations off my chest, so I ranted to Stella about her. Forget Anna. No one likes her anyway. As for Jaden, it's obvious he likes you. He's just new here and probably feels too shy to ask you out. Yeah, you're probably right. He must just be shy. But, ugh, I know Anna won't quit chasing him. Then you should make your relationship with Jaden official. Stella had a point. If Jaden was too shy to ask me out, then maybe I should take the initiative. Then Anna would have no choice but to back off. Ha! Huh. Tonight was the night. So I texted Jaden, I need your help with something. Let's meet at 8 p.m. by the slide in the park. But then he messaged back saying he couldn't meet tonight as he had to help his mom with something. Right that moment, my dad arrived home earlier than usual and announced that he was taking me and my sister Megan out for dinner. Ooh, this restaurant looked nice. I walked in alongside Megan and... Huh? What were Jaden and his mom doing here? Then my dad walked over to Cynthia, kissed her on the cheek, and said, Hello, honey. Jaden and I shared astonished looks. Then we peered at the adults for an explanation. Laura? Megan? This is Ms. Green, the lady I told you about. What? I mean, I knew Dad was dating a woman named Ms. Green, but I had no idea she was Jaden's mom. Then, before we knew what was happening, Dad got down on one knee and pulled out this diamond ring and asked her to marry him. And you know what? She said yes! Oh, no. No, 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 no! They can't marry! Because then Jaden will be my brother! Megan looked delighted and hugged them both, while I stared at Jaden in bewilderment. Don't get me wrong, I really want my dad to be happy, but why her? And what about me and Jaden? After that, Cynthia seemed to always be at our house, baking cakes, humming while she dusted and cleaned up, and exchanging gooey looks with my dad. Ew. Then one day, she insisted that Megan and I went wedding dress shopping with her. She tried on this one dress, and yeah, okay, she looked pretty good in it. But when she asked me what I thought about it, I just shook my head and said, well, it's not very flattering, is it? She tried on several more dresses, but I managed to find fault with them all. Then, when I noticed how disheartened she looked, I patted her shoulder and said, Don't worry, Cynthia. You can always postpone the wedding until you find a suitable dress. She looked a bit taken aback, but then she just smiled at me and said, That's okay, Laura. I'm going to go with the first one. Ugh. Anyway, now the dress was chosen, so at least I could go home now, right? Wrong. As on the way home, we passed an arcade. Cynthia led us there and then excitedly challenged me to a game of air hockey. Then I said jokingly, Fine, I'll play, but if you lose, you don't deserve to be my mother. And guess what? She won! Ugh! And worse still, Megan wouldn't quit giving me dirty looks for the comments I'd made. Jeez, I was just joking. What is wrong with you today? I plopped down on the couch and blurted out everything. She'd take my side, right? Um, turns out, no, she wouldn't. What? You and Jaden aren't even official. But Dad loves Cynthia. They both deserve happiness.
so stop being a brat about it. Then she stormed off to her room. Ugh, I feel like I'm going crazy. I have huge feelings towards Jaden, and I know he feels the same. So why can't my sister be mature enough to understand that and support me? I needed to vent to someone. Luckily for me, I had Stella. Why does no one care about my feelings? I can't be Jaden's sister. Um, sorry, Lara. I don't know what to say. Suddenly, from the nearby table came a lousy voice. So that's the reason why Jaden has to hang out with you? You're pathetic, Lara. Turns out we were so lost in conversation, we didn't notice Anna and her flock sitting at the table behind us. Actually, we've been into each other for ages. It's not our fault our parents made some dumb decision. Anyway, whether we can be together or not, it doesn't change the fact that you bore him so much that he'd choose watching paint dry over being with you. How dare you! She was about to grab my hair, but right at that moment, a hand stopped her. It was Jaden! That afternoon, on our walk home, I finally came clean to Jaden. I like you a lot. I have always been since I first met you. I know you like me too, but you think it'll be awkward because our parents are getting married. Maybe if we just tell- Laura, you're such a sweet girl. And I do like you. But just as a sister. What? How could he say that to me? He had to like me. Didn't he? Feeling an unexplainable amount of shame and embarrassment, I ran away from him. As I lay on my bed and rubbed my tear-stained eyes, all I could think about was how unfair this was. So, by the time Dad called me down for dinner, and I walked in and saw how happy he looked, my anger got the better of me and I yelled, I hate you, and I hate Cynthia! How dare you try and replace Mom! Then I rushed back to my room. You really upset Dad. You know that, right? I didn't answer. I was also upset, but no one seemed to care about my feelings. Dad said we come first, so if you really feel this strongly about it, then he'll cancel the wedding. To be honest, I'm real mad with you right now. So? What about me? You're so immature and selfish! I didn't understand how my own sister could be so uncaring. So I screamed out. So what? You don't care that mom's being replaced by some fake woman? And what about me? Why does no one care how I feel? Oh my god, Laura, for once, this isn't about you! Megan rolled her eyes at me, then stormed off. Finally, everyone quit going on about the stupid wedding. But why didn't I feel good about this? Cynthia didn't seem to be coming round to our house anymore, and I noticed how Dad's cooking seemed to get worse and worse, until he stopped altogether and just ordered takeout. Meanwhile, Jaden wasn't anywhere to be seen at school. Stella asked around to find out where he was, and turns out he'd left, as he was moving back to his old town. No way! After school... I rushed straight over to his house and barged inside to find him and his mom packing. Are you... moving away? <sighs> yeah. I moved here to settle down and start a new life with Randall. And this house is for Jaden's future. But the wedding's been cancelled, so... I quickly asked Jaden if we could talk outside. My mom's cried so much. Randall's her soulmate and she can't stay around her if she can't be with him anymore. The most annoying part is that she agrees with him that the kids must come first. So, I hope you're happy now? Oh my god, what have I done? His words were like a stab to my gut. Oh no, this was all my fault. I was so obsessed with Jaden that I didn't stop to think about what was best for everyone else. Without saying another word, I ran back home and burst into the kitchen where Dad was drearily staring into his iced coffee. Dad, you deserve to be happy with Cynthia. So, please go and tell her how you feel before she leaves for good.
but it was too late. Cynthia and Jaden had gone. Just kidding! <laughs> nah, actually, Dad managed to catch Cynthia just in time, and he told her how much he loves her and can't live without her. So, guess what? Yep, they got married, and now they're both happier than ever. I've learned the hard way that being selfish and inconsiderate of other people's feelings for my own gain just makes everyone miserable, including myself. So now we're one big happy family. And I suppose having Jaden as a brother isn't actually so bad after all. My phone beeped with a new message. Emma, I've got something to do nearby, so let's meet there. See ya. It was from Tony my childhood friend from the orphanage back in Missouri. Yep, that's right. I ended up in an orphanage after my mom passed away when I was only four years old. But things were even worse for Tony and him. They'd been left outside the orphanage door without anyone even knowing who their parents were. And now here I am, on my way to visit his grave, as today's his death anniversary. <sighs> Time flies. I can hardly believe it's been ten years already. I picked up some flowers, then drove to the cemetery. Tony was already there waiting for me. I smiled and waved, but my heart felt heavy. Back when we were fourteen, we'd been joined at the hip, Tony, Thomas, and me. I had a secret crush on Thomas, but I never got the chance to tell him. It had all happened so fast on that day. We were just kids, young and dumb. We'd snuck out to go play by the riverbank. One minute we were splashing each other in the river. The next moment, Thomas was being carried away in the current. I tried to save him, but Tony pulled me back to shore. Even thinking about it now, I still couldn't help but burst into tears. Don't cry, Em. I'll always be here for you. And I knew he would be. Deep down, I knew Tony always had feelings for me. But I didn't feel the same way. <sighs> After that, Tony drove me home. Seeing my exhausted look, he said before I went inside, Get a good night's sleep, Em. Remember, we've got that interview tomorrow. Gosh, I almost forgot. Tony probably thought I was the worst employee ever. <laughs> and yes, you can guess it. Tony is my boss. After years in the orphanage, he was adopted by a super smart family that had inspired him to strive to become someone important, and he'd eventually built a food startup. Anyway, the following morning, despite still feeling worn out, I had no choice but to put on a brave face to go to work, as I had a marketing team to lead. But as I walked into the lobby, a guy bumped into me. He helped me up and frantically apologized, explaining he was in a rush. I looked up and was about to nag him, but wait, why does he look so familiar? In fact, he looked exactly like, it's you, you, I stammered, but I couldn't even finish my sentences because he'd rushed into the lift and the doors had closed. I must have been seeing things. Honestly, throughout the whole interview, I could barely concentrate. Could there be two people looking that similar on this earth? I was lost in thought when the next applicant came in, and it was him. Both Tony and I stared in shock. He was the spinning image of Thomas. But it couldn't be. I mean, Thomas had died years ago. We both were too stunned to say anything until his voice broke the silence. Hi, I'm Dustin, and I'm here to interview for the marketing position. I looked at Tony, and he looked just as confused as I did. But... Yeah, it wasn't Thomas. This guy was from Illinois and had never even been to Missouri. Okay, so here's Thomas's doppelganger. Fair enough. The interview went well, and even though he was a bit arrogant, he knew what he was doing, so we hired him. When I left the room, surprisingly, Dustin was still waiting for me outside. He offered to treat me to lunch as an apology for earlier. I agreed, as I was desperate to ask him more questions. During lunch, I kept mentioning the orphanage, some of Thomas's hobbies and things he hated, but Dustin didn't even bat an eyelid. I was disappointed, because I really hoped Dustin would actually be Thomas. That night, I barely slept. 
I couldn't stop thinking about Dustin. It's ridiculous, but I still had a strong feeling that he really was my childhood sweetheart. Suddenly, I got a message from Tony. Saw you hanging out with Dustin. Wake up, Em. He's not Thomas. Ugh, I didn't need to hear that. The next day, I couldn't take my eyes off of Dustin. At lunch, I watched as he put honey on his watermelon, and I almost freaked out. That was exactly what Thomas used to do. Oh my, I blurted out. I then told Tony what I just saw as soon as he sat down, but he just laughed and said, Honestly, Em, tons of people do that. Do you really think that our Thomas could be that arrogant? Seeing that I was still unfazed, he continued, But if you still want to check, just give him a peach. Things can change, but allergies don't, right? OMG, Tony was a genius. He probably was just kidding, but I was super serious. So the next day, I bought Dustin a peach pie to welcome him to the team. But to my surprise, he ate it up with pleasure and seemed totally fine. Okay, clearly I needed to let this go. He wasn't Thomas. End of. But if only things were that simple. And even though I knew Dustin wasn't Thomas, I still felt attracted to him. He was smart and sweet and so much fun to be around. Eventually, we started hanging out and became very close. We didn't actually make anything official, but we were low-key dating already. However, it was impossible to hide things from Tony. One time, our company went on a team bonding weekend, and we'd arranged a tennis competition. We had to pair up, so obviously I would go with Dustin, but as we're about to go sign up, then Tony came to ask me to be his partner too. My god, it was so awkward. Then Tony said in a very sulky tone, Okay, how about we have a little competition? The winner gets to pair up with Emma. And so they had a swimming race. That's so embarrassing. I knew Dustin couldn't swim, so I started to panic, but he got in the pool anyway. Obviously, Tony won, but who cares? He was acting like a child. I rushed over to help Dustin, who was left coughing and choking on the water. And at that moment, I realized that I was falling for him so much. But since then, there were rumors in the company that Dustin was only flirting with me to get promoted. One morning, we were walking through the lobby together when two girls started whispering about us. So Dustin took my hand and went straight to the girls saying, I love Emma. What's wrong with that? Hmm, tell me. Go on. At that exact moment, Tony appeared and asked if he could have a word with Dustin in his office. I was so nervous. Now everyone knew we were in some weird triangle, and I didn't like it one bit. Then one of my colleagues overheard Tony telling Dustin that if he didn't leave me alone, he'd be fired. I couldn't believe it. I went to find Tony right away, and before I could even confront him, he said, Yes, it's true. I asked those girls to start the rumors, and I also asked that jerk to give up on you. It was me. I did it all. I just don't get it, Em. Why have I ever been good enough for you? Tony, wait. It's been ten years. Why couldn't you give me a chance? Why can't you let Thomas go? Some guy who looks like him walks up and you totally forget about me? He's a loser compared to Thomas. Don't you dare call him a loser, I said. See? In the end... You still care about him only, not me, Tony shouted and stormed off. I hated to be in this situation. On the one hand, I truly liked Dustin, but Tony was not only my lifesaver, but also my best friend, who'd stuck by my side through all the highs and lows. What a dilemma. In the end, I decided to have a little space from Dustin, just until things cooled down. Maybe then the rumors would stop and people would quit being so negative about him. But that wasn't to be so. You see, our new product that hadn't even been released yet suddenly appeared on the website of our direct competitor. Someone must have leaked the confidential file. But who? An investigation was opened and all of our computers were checked. You won't believe it, but the IT team had been able to recover a deleted email that had been sent to our rivals from Dustin's outbox. Dustin denied it, and he demanded to check the CCTV. 
That's how we caught Mike, one of our senior employees, at Dustin's computer sneakily doing something. And to think, he'd put the blame on Dustin. After the truth came out, I went over to Dustin, but he seemed mad as he said, You think I'm a jerk too, don't you? That's why you've been giving me the cold shoulder. I told him I never believed he'd done it. Then I took his hand. I'm so sorry. It's just that I've been through some stuff. Then we hugged. Oh my, I missed him so much. But the drama didn't end there. The info leaked had caused our company huge losses. We had thousands of meetings, and the stress was unreal. Feeling so deflated, I went up to the rooftop to get some air. Suddenly, I heard Dustin's voice somewhere. He was on the phone with someone, talking about some plan to steal our company's products. No way! Without even thinking, I charged over and snatched his phone away to see that he was talking to... Mike? Oh my god! Had they been accomplices from the beginning? I was so angry, but actually more disappointed. So I asked him to resign and stay away from my sight. I know I should have exposed him to the whole company instead of letting him go that easy, but I guess my heart couldn't bear to do that. <sighs> I felt so bad, especially towards Tony, the best friend who's always by my side, while I was busy chasing after a jerk. I lost contact with Dustin after that, and I barely had time to think about it because our company was on the brink of bankruptcy. But one day, I got a call from him, followed by a message saying, Please don't ignore me. I've got something important to tell you. So we met up the next day at a coffee shop, and as soon as I saw him, I said, Look, Dustin, I've had enough of your lies. Please just get to the point. Then he replied, Emma, I admit that I only came to work for your company to steal your ideas, but seeing you and Tony after all these years, and falling for you all over again... Well, that wasn't part of my plan. I was confused. After all these years? What are you talking about? Then he showed me his wrist, and he was wearing a friendship bracelet. Remember this? You gave it to me on my birthday ten years ago. O-M-G. What was going on? I couldn't believe my eyes. I'd given this to Thomas. But then why... But the peach... I continued. He just laughed and said, I overheard you guys' plan, so I made sure to take allergy meds just before. Then he went on to explain that he was Thomas, and that he'd been lucky enough to be saved that day on the river. There was a family who were out in the river searching for their drowned son, but instead of finding him, they found Thomas, and so they kindly adopted him and changed his name to their sons, Dustin. This was insane! Here was Thomas right in front of me, after all these years. And guess what? His adoptive father is the director of our rival company. And so he'd asked Dustin, or should I say Thomas, to come and infiltrate our company. Thomas kept apologizing for it, saying how much it had tormented him, and that he just missed me and had to tell me the truth. My head was spinning. This was all too much. I needed a moment to think it all through. But in the end, we decided that he could help our company by uploading a post to expose the truth. Obviously, as soon as Tony heard about it all, he was furious. He was mostly mad at me because I'd covered for Thomas. He'd even stopped talking to me for a while. But putting that aside, after Thomas's post, things got better for our company. We were able to launch new products as scheduled, and he even contributed some capital to help with our new project. Now our companies are still rivals, but at least it's now a fair competition. As for Tony and I, we eventually made up. He came to find me one day after work and said, Um, I'm so sorry for how childish I've been. I was just jealous of you and Thomas. I was too selfish to consider your feelings. But you and Thomas, I want you guys to be together. You two are made for each other. I couldn't stop crying as he said that. It meant so much to me. And guess what? It has now been a whole year since Thomas came back into our lives, and the three of us are back to being the best of friends. Oh, and I should probably add that Thomas and I are engaged. We're so happy, and we're even opening an orphanage together for homeless kids like us. 
I'm going through many phases, but I finally found peace in life. I guess it all worked out after all. I was walking down the hallway to see the infamous dude standing there, doing his old trick to pick on some shy student. Get that filthy hand off him now! Then I grabbed him and threw him away like a piece of paper. Ah, that's better. Konnichiwa, I'm Yukiko from Japan, the daughter of Fuji, a famous martial art master and the principal of a karate school. As his only child, it's up to me to evolve my warrior spirit and protect the weak from any baka. And this shy girl is Chiharu, the one I saved from a fight with the rival school gang. And ever since then, we became besties. Well, that's also how I earned the nickname Big Boss. I don't really care about it, but it does have some perks. I always had the best reserved seat next to the window, a desk drawer full of snacks, and on top of that, the kid was competing every day to do my homework. However, it also caused me some complications. I seem to have caught the eye of Jun, that rival school's gang leader. He bought me flowers and sent me these cheesy cupcakes every day, but I only gave him a no. Hey, he comes again. If I was your boyfriend, never let you go. Keep you on my arm, girl. You keep go, never be alone. Tomato, tomato, throwing tomatoes. Even when the guard came carrying him away, he was still shouting. You keep go, die, scooter! Gosh, he's such a bug. Later, I came into the classroom and found everyone was going cuckoo over something. How noisy! That's the new student. He's just so handsome. As if you could tell someone's handsome from the back. But when he turned around, my eyes almost bulged from their sockets. It's Akira. Back when we were little, I adored Akira from the moment I first saw him. To me, he was even cuter than my favorite Mochi Shiba plushie. So I followed him everywhere and gave him all the candies I had. But he didn't like it that much. Why did you give her my candies? I like Akira. If you take him from me, I'll punch you. Hey, martial arts is not about fighting nonsense. You fierce kid, I hate you. After a while, Akira's family moved away and I'd completely lost contact with him. And now he's back. Our eyes met, but he looked so cold and turned away. He didn't recognize me? Fine, it was so embarrassing facing him again anyway. So I decided to avoid him like the plague since then. And just like that, with his excellent academic ability, Akira soon fell into place as the top student, while I'm a bit different. I may have been a black belt in the karate, but exams were definitely not my thing. Congratulations, you've excelled at coming last again. So, Yukiko, I've appointed another student to tutor you. Please don't say his name, please don't say his name, please, please, please. Akira, I nearly died on the spot. Can anybody throw me to Mars, please? Man, it's super awkward. I kept looking at the ground when he blurted out, Hi, Yukiko. Long time no see. So, he does remember me? During the lesson, I couldn't focus, and my body was heating up. I kept my mouth shut while he was immersed in his lecture. If there's anything you don't understand, feel free to ask. I plucked up my courage and said, Why didn't you like me when we were kids? You're still acting like before. <laughs> I'm trying to teach you, but your head's stuck in the clouds. Focus. He didn't say he hated me, did he? My heart fluttered again. Guess I'd have to try harder to get his attention then. But things didn't exactly go as planned. During the lessons with Akira, my phone rang constantly with calls and messages. Seemed like my goons were in trouble and they needed my help. I tried my best to ignore it, but finally gave in. I've got something to do. I'll be right back. Hey, those morons. They're always messing around, then leave it to me. Problem solved. Only that, lucky for you, I got there in time. In time to cause more trouble? I'd have eaten them for breakfast without you. Back at school, I saw Akira standing at the gate with a clearly not happy face. Akira, it's not like what you think, I- You find it hard to study, but fighting seems to come naturally to you, huh? Who the freak are you? How dare you talk to my girl like that? Akira, I fight to help people. It's not nonsense. Help? I suppose brainless people only know how to talk with their fists. June immediately lunged at Akira, raising his fists at him. I had to hold him back right away and told him to go. The silence went on for some minutes, but when he was about to leave, I couldn't stand it anymore. Just because I liked you then, you think you have the right to look down on me? What? Hear this. I do like you, but it doesn't mean I will like you forever. I don't care, but I'm sorry if the truth I spoke made you feel that I looked down on you. And you know what? If you can't take my tutoring seriously, then we're done. Fine, go! See if I care. I, the big boss myself, have my own limits and cannot be chasing him all the time. 
but I couldn't deny that a pit was dropping to the bottom of my stomach. I just want to go home and curl up under cover. Then I arrived at my family's karate academy to see it was all sealed off, and my dad was sitting on the doorstep holding a letter. Dad? What happened? Yukiko. I'm bankrupt. I had no choice but to sell the academy to moneylenders. I've lost everything. No! This academy is our family legacy! My dad's life's work! We couldn't lose it! So I followed the address on the letter, but there I met an unexpected person. June! Turns out, his dad is my dad's creditor. All or nothing, I decided to get straight to the point to him. What do my family have to do to get our martial arts school back? June came over and whispered something in his ear. Then he pondered a while and said, My son kept goofing around. Change him and the martial arts school is back to yours. But how? I want you to get engaged to my son. Are you serious? You think I'm a joke? Then I immediately stood up and left. That was insane. Hey, why are you behaving like that? You're still asking why? It's down to that dude, isn't it? He's just some preppy know-it-all who doesn't even like you. You... you know nothing. He also likes... me, I think. Is that so? Then prove it. Make Akira fall in love with you within two weeks, and I'll convince my father to extend the deadline by three months. Fail, and we get engaged. I'm the one who is always by your side. No way I agree with your stupid deal. Go ahead, refuse. The martial arts school will be permanently closed tomorrow. Wait, I, I, okay. I'm in. Lucky enough, I had Chiharu, the love guru, to help me cook up the perfect Get Akira scheme. Though she'd been single, like, forever. <laughs> Firstly, I told my gang that Akira'd soon to be my BF, and also their boss, so he deserved a special treat. Wherever he went, other students bowed 90 degrees to greet him. They tended to his every need, carried his bag, and were always at his service. But he seemed not so comfortable about this. Ask your goons to stop their nonsense. Okay, as long as you agree to my conditions. What? Tutor me again. Oh, and have lunch together. And walk to and from school? I... I can't. Okay then, guys! Fine! Secondly, you needed to find out what Akira liked, but he'll refuse to answer my questions for sure. My fake council survey will answer that. Then she handed out the paper to the whole class. My goofy Chiharu did get it done this time. Okay, according to a philosopher, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Akira's most favorite food is beef, so I rummaged through all the local supermarkets to find A5 Wagyu beef and prepared this perfect meal for him. Akira, eat this. Oh, thank you, Cream Puff. How come you know I like beef? How did you get in here? I know you miss me, so I come to visit. Before I could say anything, Akira shook his head and walked off. Okay. The first step is always the hardest. Next, seeing that Akira liked horror movies, I lied to him that Chiharu stood me up, so I had an extra ticket. It's insidious. How could he refuse? But as soon as we sat down, a familiar face caught my attention. June? Stop messing with me, you child! Eh? I'm a horror fan, just like you. We're sure a match made in heaven. I tried to ignore him and focus on my plan. This was the third time I watched this, so I knew exactly when there'd be a jump scare. It's time. I pasted a whining look on my face and was about to lean on Akira when June suddenly screamed his lungs out and jumped at me. It was not until he fell asleep that we had a bit of privacy, but from then till we left, Akira didn't speak a word and even asked to leave early. That's not okay. If things kept going this way, the whole plan would definitely fail. And it means I'd have to get engaged to June. No! The next day, I wasn't in the mood for dealing with my friends, so I lingered back in the classroom and read through Akira's notes. Oh, what's this? So, he does care about me. I can see one ray of hope. Akira, I want to improve my studies. Help me? Oh, okay. I was waiting outside for Akira to get us some bubble teas before we started, when suddenly this thief darted out and snatched this old lady's bag. I dove in there to help, but he knocked me to the ground and ran away. Here you go. You're already fighting again? Don't you have anything better to do? I'm not fight. Forget it anyway. This brave young lady helped me. W what? Say no more. I'm a bad person no matter what. Then I stormed off without looking back. I was so stupid to catch feels with that insensitive one. Then my knee suddenly collapsed. Right then, a hand reached out and gently wrapped a bandage around my knee. Leave me alone. Get on my back. Shut up. Come on. I couldn't help but smile through my frown, and my heart did a cartwheel. I clambered onto his back and looped my arms around his neck. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you... It's okay. Are you dumb? An injured leg is not enough? It's nothing. And... You don't have to carry me like this. Am I heavy? What? <laughs> 
If I say yes, will you jump off? No way. After that day, Akira changed towards me. He joined me for lunch and even gave me a cute cupcake and agreed to go to Cat Cafe with me, even though he's allergic. And the classes went so smoothly. He was sweet like a lollipop and answered to all my silly questions. One time, I even accidentally saw him putting a lot of bandages in my locker. Aww. Winning the bet didn't seem so impossible then, but suddenly a girl approached him. It was Amaya, the school's popular girl. They chewed the fat. Then she leaned closer and whispered something to him. His face suddenly turned cold. Then he walked away. I was about to go after him when my phone beeped. Can't tutor you today. I have a play audition. So, turns out Akira and Amaya were both in this play. Fine, if Akira's Romeo, then I must be Juliet. I made it to the final round with my big boss energy, which meant I got to act out a scene with Akira to see who got the female lead between me and Amaya. Oh dear, look at them, being all clingy for what? That snake was all over my poor Akira like a rash. Ugh, if Chiharu hadn't constantly held me back, I'd have jumped there and given her a piece of my mind. And now, it's time for me to shine. But why is Akira's face darkened? It's okay, maybe he's trying to be professional? My bounty is as boundless as the sea. My love. My love, as adoring as, as a puppy dog's nose. Um, yes, so I may have forgotten the words, but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> he may pick me for my quick thinking and... I choose Amaya, miss. Hey, why did you pick her? You shouldn't ask me, ask yourself instead. Then he left with Amaya without glancing at me. But today is the end of the two-week deadline. I thought you'd have some feelings for me too. It was pouring rain. I trudged home, all collapsed, tears and rain falling down all over my face. It was all over. The bed I play, the boy I love. I should have known better that it was me onto a loser right from the outset. Through my teary eyes, I saw June running towards me. Yukiko, what's wrong? Tell me. I, I lost. What? The bet between us. I lost it. I was wrong about everything. Who cares about the bet? You might get a cold, you know. Get inside. But why you're here? I don't care if you think it's too late. I'm telling you anyway. I know that I'm not perfect like him. I do say the wrong thing. I forget all the time, but I... I can protect and will never hurt you. So will you... marry me? My head was spinning, and in a moment of weakness, I said yes. At least I can save my dad's school and be with the right person who truly cares about me, instead of chasing some jerk who thought so low of me. I confided in Chiharu and my family about this, but kept it a secret from everyone else. <sighs> my father didn't approve it at first, but seeing my determination, he reluctantly agreed. It was our fitting day. I was with June discussing our wedding, but he seemed distracted and kept checking his phone. Then he said he had to take a call and hurried out. Sensing something was up, I followed him. Huh? Why is he talking to Amaya? You have to thank me for your new fiancé. I told Akira about your bet. Um? Excellent job, as promised. It's not about the money. It's about making Akira mine. I don't get why both you and my beautiful Yukiko like that dude so much. Anyway, Yukiko's waiting for me. Gotta go. I couldn't believe what was in front of me. What the heck are you doing here? So it's you who made up everything the whole time? No, Yukiko. Let me explain. I trusted you, Jun. But look what you've done. You know what? You win. Do your worst. I don't care anymore. Then I ran home as fast as I could. Why do boys all fool me around like that? Right when I felt more disheartened than ever, I met the one that I didn't want to see the most. What was Akira doing here? Yukiko, let's talk. We have nothing to talk about. Chiharu told me what you're doing. You can't marry June. You liked me, so you mustn't fall for another one that easily. What? So you're the commander of my feelings now? Aren't you with Amaya? I'm not, and I never did. Listen, I was so angry to find out I was just part of your bet with June, so I ignored you. But then Chiharu told me why you did it and made me understand. So what? Anyway, you never liked me. I'm not gentle and too fierce, as you said before. Don't try to pity me. I don't. It's that I do like you. At first, I thought you were the type of person who'd use violence to solve any problem. But the more I got to know you, the more I learned about your pure heart. I shouldn't have judged you so quickly. I'm sorry. What just happened? I might be dreaming? But no, Akira, my seven-year crush, just confessed his love with me. So, Akira and I got together. June was furious about it, but he kept his word, and now my dad has three months to pay off his debt. I'm helping him out by teaching karate classes to earn money, something I really enjoy. Everything was great, too great, until... Yukiko, I gotta tell you something. I... I have to go abroad to study. I'll leave tomorrow. What? 
I don't understand. Why so sudden? I prepared for it months ago, but I couldn't tell you. I didn't want to make you sad. Will you wait for me? Of course not. I may get bored and start liking another by that time. It's time. I stood still watching the train pass by until I noticed Akira's melancholy smile. I liked you seven years ago, and now I still do. So of course I can wait for you. Come back soon, Akira. How long is this going to take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kinda hard. Well, at least dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no phone policy to avoid leaks. So if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, Dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself, which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the Carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and, ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to God, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend, tiny Timmy, had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad, though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first. Then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look. And could use a hand. Or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so it didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Lady Bird. Such a heartwarming coming-of-age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do. Like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which, by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out, when suddenly, my dear boyfriend, Blake, made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle, 
and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated-looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious, how did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool. But honestly, I never expected our relationship to last. Just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. Don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched him drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Jeez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time? I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I Ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far. Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night. But if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. And he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. 
Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up. I just didn't know how. Seeing how happy and smiley he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, no, no. It's not real. Happy-looking families are not actually happy. And the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage. Then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second. That means... Their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it. I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But, obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over, get away from her! Tim, thank God! Goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops and this time they reported to the scene ASAP. Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her, even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault. And Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation. I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for- If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. They actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me. 
while dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left it a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me. They just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together, thinking it would be best for me. But the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes, so they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast, but I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off. I arrived home in really good spirits after an exciting training session and my mood took an instant nosedive to see my devious cousin Caitlin holding my diary. Oh wow, so your crush is Leo, the swimming club captain, huh? Give me it back. I wonder if the whole school knows yet. Don't worry, your devoted cousin is here to help. Thanks a lot, but I'll do it myself. Stop poking your big nose in my business. Hey, um, first, your nose is much bigger than mine. And second, about Leo, Leo, whatever. He'll be mine soon. Tit for tat. Payback for stealing my boyfriend. How ridiculous. And so not true. She should blame herself for having terrible taste in men instead. No thanks. I didn't want a player like him either. Hi, I'm Megan, the leader of the school scout club. I'm friendly, fun, and love going on adventures, just like my explorer dad. So, of course, girls like Caitlin don't scare me. From day one of my dear cousin moving in with us, it was clear we were never going to get on. I love to run around the garden and learn interesting survival tricks with my dad, while Caitlin can't even stand a speck of dirt. Oh my god! Billions of germs are attacking me! Get me sanitizer! No! And it didn't help at all that Caitlin's jerk of a boyfriend asked me out right after breaking up with her. Despite my clear disinterest in him, she blamed me. That's when we were officially like Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and the prank wars began. She drew on my face in permanent marker while I slept, stuck gum in my hair, and once she even tried to shave my eyebrows. But who am I, huh? I can beat her with only one move. But now, the stakes have been raised. She's going after Leo. So I need to confess my feelings to him ASAP before Caitlin butts in and ruins it. The perfect opportunity would be the upcoming school field trip for top students, which Caitlin definitely can't join. And there will be plenty of chances for me to impress Leo. But there's one slight problem. It's by a river. OMG, thinking of it made me want to pee my pants already. Ahem. <clears throat> I have thalassophobia, which is an intense fear of large bodies of water. Of course, I keep this a secret because no one will take me seriously as a scout leader if they find out about this. However, this is a once-in-a-lifetime deal, and no way can I just sit at home while Caitlin digs her claws into Leo. So, I signed up for the trip and set up a master plan for it. Baby steps. I mean, literally. I signed up for swimming in a kid-friendly pool. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Oh, but why are my legs trembling like this? Ha <laughs> ha It's not like I've morphed into a jellyfish or something. Look, the pool is turning into the scary ocean ready to swallow me! Help! Suddenly, a boy with a floaty bumped into me. I fell on my butt and my leg touched the water. Something grabbed me. Loch Ness Monster! It's eating me alive! Just then, a kid popped up and started laughing at me. It's okay, Megan. Happy thoughts. Think happy thoughts. Ah, this is much better. But then I felt splashes everywhere. I tried to avoid them but ended up toppling over and fell into the water. Panicking, I spluttered and flailed about. I couldn't care any less about everyone looking at me weirdly anymore and just screamed for dear life. Suddenly, strong arms pulled me out of the water. Then that guy carried me, and my face pressed right against his chest. Holy moly, it felt harder than a rock. You all right? Oh, my Superman. I'll be your Lois Lane. Ew, snot is streaming down your face. Disgusting. Gosh, this is so embarrassing. I got dressed at the speed of light and ran out of there. Um, hang on. Something isn't right. Hey, missing something? Jesus! This jerk still tried to embarrass me at the last minute? The only good guy in this world is my Leo! As if it's still not enough to call it a day, I came home to see Caitlin watching a scary movie about a giant shark. Sup? Scared of me already? It's not too late to cling onto my leg and beg! Who's <laughs> scared? 
This stupid show, it's obviously all CGI. There's no shark in the world that could be that big. <laughs> and um, they're labeled as dangerous, indiscriminate killers. They eat anything in sight. But in fact, sharks are most often the victims. Whew. My acting was not so bad, was it? Finally, the field trip participants list was published. Of course, my name was on it, and Leo too. But wait, why is Caitlin here? She's always wrapped up with boys instead of studying, and doesn't even remember the multiplication table. What? Can't accept the fact that I'm a genius too? FYI, I am super quick at math. Really? So what is 356 plus 445? Easy, 234. Huh? That's not even close. But it was quick. See you on the trip. I'll be watching you, sis. The day finally came, and our tour guide is Mike, the best scout in the state. But hold on, why does this guy look familiar? Oh no, that's the guy who saved me at the pool. Scared that he'll expose me, I didn't know what to do but to give him the stupidest smile. To my surprise, he seemed not to remember me at all. Then he asked me to demonstrate the first activity with him, vertical neck climbing. It's time for me to shine. Eyes on me, Leo. Gosh, this guy climbed like a monkey. But don't expect me to accept a loss. I was enjoying the victory when Caitlin approached me. Everyone knows that muscle power is only to make up for a tiny brain. Yeah, great shout, Megan. Use all your energy up in one go just so you can show off. Are they cut from the same cloth? Never mind. Hmm, Leo's looking at me. His eyes are so dreamy. That was even more powerful than ten cans of monster drinks. Nature Hunt, Monkey Bridge, Tarzan Rope, all these challenges didn't make me break into a sweat, and Leo even came to praise me. That's incredible, Megan. How can you do that? Oh, Leo, I only had an apple for breakfast, so now I'm having hypoglycemia or something. I'm so dizzy. OMG, my dear cousin should really get an Oscar nomination for her fake act. I gave my sweetest smile and helped her. Just so when Leo wasn't looking, I tripped her up and she fell face first into a muddy puddle. Leo tried to wipe it off, but ended up turning her into a monkey. Then Mike walked past and said, Wow, this layer of makeup is a big improvement. His caddish tongue seemed not to leave anyone alone. In the afternoon, I took my free time to wander around and saw a pretty bird. Hmm, I wonder what it is. That's a red-capped mannequin. Very popular in Central American forests. Wow, good knowledge. Thanks for telling me without being asked. They have a signature dance to impress their mates. Any idea? A moonwalk that rivals Michael Jackson's. <laughs> Wait, what? Why did I laugh so hard? He might be funny, but he's still a jerk. The last activity of the day was using rocks to make fire, and I was paired with... Leo. Thank you, universe. I squidged up close to him and offered him a mint. He happily took it, but then suddenly turned red and started choking. I leaped into action and hit him hard on his back, making the mint fly out. Leo immediately took my hand. My guardian angel, where have you been all my life? Anyway, would you like to join me for a walk later? I have something to tell you. Yes! Oh, I mean, sure. Where do you want to go? The riverbank. Romantic, right? <laughs> R river? I'll die there. But so what? This is my chance. If I die, I'll die under the title of Leo's girlfriend. Totally worth it. I arrived to see Leo already waiting. His skin was glistening beneath the setting sunlight. Hmm, he was like my very own Edward Cullen, but it didn't make me any less scared. Oh, you're here. You look pale. Are you sick? Oh, no. No, I'm fine. Great. Let's get on the boat to enjoy the view. I closed my eyes tightly and squeezed Leo's hand. Then Leo kept talking, but I couldn't hear anything until... Megan, I've admired you for so long. Will you be my girlfriend? I turned into the ripest tomato, but managed to blurt out, I I'd love to! Gotcha! Gosh, why is Caitlin here? I was still in shock when Leo jumped out of the boat and... High-fived Caitlin? Then they kissed? Surprise! Surprise! Now you know how it feels to have your dream guy stolen away. No! No! Please! I, I can't stand it! The water is scaring me! Just enjoy the view, Megan! Where's that fierce girl gone? Your mom told me that you have thalassophobia, but I didn't expect it to be so real. Don't worry, I'll show this to the whole school so they'll come rescue you. Good luck, cousin. Leo and Caitlin walked off holding hands. I stayed as still as I could in the unsteady boat. The world was spinning around me, but I couldn't do anything but cry. 
Time went by like a decade had passed. Then I felt a pat on my shoulder. Mike stretched out his hand, then swooped me up in his arms and carried me to the lawn nearby. But how did you find me? I saw the video Caitlin just posted, then immediately went to look for you along the riverbank. Is that so? How embarrassing. He kept silent for a while, then said, You might not know this, but I used to be freaked out by heights. My acrophobia is better now, but still. No way! You nailed the climbing challenge earlier! If you want to overcome your fear, then you have to find a way to face it. Be courageous. Don't let it become a weakness for others to laugh at. Then he gave me the sweetest smile, and right at that moment, he looked kind of different to me. More attractive. That night, I shut myself away in my tent while the others gathered around the bonfire. I wasn't ready to face anyone just yet, and my mind was too restless to sleep. The next morning came the boat race. When I arrived, all judging eyes were on me. I was nervous, but soon plucked up my courage and spoke out. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan, and I have thalassophobia. So, I can't complete this challenge. I'm embarrassed. Not about my phobia, but about letting myself live in fear of it. I love being a scout leader with all my heart, so I'll try to beat this. Fear is not your enemy, it is your motivation. Then I walked off to cheering and clapping. Back at the tent, I saw Mike waiting for me. That's the spirit. You're really brave and have the qualities of a true adventurer. Even when you're not in the game, you've already won the special prize in my heart. Everything went smoothly after the field trip. Even Caitlin stopped bothering me. She must be busy being lovey-dovey with her new love. Until one day, I saw her arrive home sobbing. What happened? That jerk Leo, he cheated on me with two, no, three girls at the same time. Excuse me? Why is my life so miserable? I know I can never outsmart you or be as brave, as confident as you, but do I not deserve at least one nice thing? I didn't know Caitlin had this self-deprecating side. Suddenly, I felt sorry for her. She is my cousin after all. Don't cry. I'll help you teach him a lesson. Really? Megan, I'm sorry for letting my jealousy turn me into a monster. Are we good? The next day at school, we stepped into the hallway and heard a horrified scream. It was Leo with his locker full of cockroaches. He freaked out so much that his friend had to catch him before he fell over. Oh, Leo, I am just warming up. I gathered my classmates and showed them the extra special gift I'd prepared for him. Hello, everyone. This time on Name a Cockroach After Your Ex, we have here a gentleman named Leo Whittemore. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone! Everyone burst out laughing and Leo literally fainted. And now he's known as Leo the Roach. Actually, this was all Mike's idea. So we can both retaliate against Leo and donate to the Cry Me a Cockroach Wildlife Fund. And back to me. To make things right, I decided to go back to where I started. I realized nothing is impossible when you believe in yourself and when you have a perfect companion to give you the gentle nudge you need. I was walking through the forest when a scream startled me, a man running in horror from a pack of wolves. I quickly howled at them, then crouched down. Distracted, the wolves stopped, left the guy, and cautiously sniffed their way over to me. Hey girl, run away! Shush! After deciding I was no threat, they wagged their tails and started licking my face. Are, aren't you scared? Not at all. People often misunderstand wolves. This isn't Little Red Riding Hood. They're not actually grandma eaters. Come and make new friends, buddy. Hi, my name's Winona, an 18-year-old Native American living on the Blackfeet Reservation with my mom. And I'm about to tell you the craziest story of my life. After the wolves left, I helped the guy find a place to clean his wound and told him more about the wolves. So you're a Blackfoot born and bred? It's my first time meeting a Native American. How about you? What brings you here, city boy? I'm actually a pianist wandering here for inspiration. Have you found it yet? Or did you almost lose yourself just then? <laughs> Inspiration's hard to find, especially when you're a theater pianist. A what? A theater pianist. I work at Winter Garden. In New York? Wow, it's my dream to be a Broadway musical actress. Actually, my theater's looking for a stage crew. You could start from there and I'll find ways to introduce you to the right people. I couldn't let such a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity slide. But the thing is, my mom absolutely resents theater arts and forbids me to even mention it. So, I gotta devise a plan. 
I brought Luke home for lunch. Mom was so welcoming and even prepared a great banquet. So Luke, right? What brings you to Montana? I'm doing a research paper for school. I'm, I'm in college. Oh, so you're around the same age as Winona. She's recently finished high school. I know, and if it wasn't for Winona, I'd be dead by now. So I was thinking, if it's okay with you, I'd like to invite her to college with me. That's nice of you. But what are you studying? Uh, hotel management. Mom, I thought I could give it a try too. But honey, you said you wanted to take a gap year. I just didn't want to try college alone. But now I've met Luke, it'll be different. Mrs. Ryder, I promise I'll take good care of her. Mom smiled, then nodded. Yes, mission accomplished. Oh man, look at how crazy the streets of New York are. Thankfully, Luke arranged a small place just a few blocks away from the theater for me. And the following day, he landed me a staff member job to get me used to the theater scene first. It's not easy, especially working for a grumpy director with a zillion demands. Hey, you! Yes, you cleaning lady! Out of the way! But just being here this close to the stage is incredible, right? One day, on set for Mr. Killorn's new play, he started yelling and throwing papers everywhere. Curious, I picked up the script and saw a line written in Blackfoot. Ketsi kakumen? I love you? Mr. Killorn suddenly noticed me. Oops, I must have said it too loud. How did you learn to speak Blackfoot? My mom taught me. Oh, I live in the Blackfeet Reservation. Interesting. You know what? You're cast for the leading role in this play. Go and meet Jade, the coach, here at the theater studio. She'll instruct you further. I froze on the spot and couldn't believe what had just happened until Luke appeared, bowed to the director, and pulled me out of there. Am I finally living my dream now? Here it is, the studio from the business card. Huh? Are they shooing a coyote? This stupid guy was waving his umbrella at the snarling animal. I tried to tell everyone to back up, but no one heard my tiny voice until the guy next to me suddenly spoke up. Everyone, back up! Thank God people finally listened. I slowly advanced to the coyote, knelt, and offered my hand to him. When he seemed to trust me enough, I gently stroked his head and calmed him down. Just then, Mr. Killorn's assistant appeared and took the coyote in. Turned out, he's Mr. Killorn's pet. Who keeps a wild creature as a pet in this stuffy, urban space? You okay? You hurt anywhere? I'm fine. The poor little coyote looked terrified. You know a lot about animals, don't you? I grew up with them, yeah. In Blackfoot mythology, coyotes are guardian spirits. Well, you sure were a guardian spirit right then. I was still so touched by his words, but then Luke suddenly appeared. Winona, I just heard about what happened. You okay? What are you doing here? The guy, who was friendly just a second ago, now seemed cautious and just walked away while Luke glared at him. I'm fine. You should stay away from him. Hmm. Luke doesn't seem to like that guy. Something weird is going on between these two? I went and met Jade, our coach. She told me about the role and introduced me to Nathan, my actor partner, which happened to be the guy I just met. I couldn't help but grin and offered my hand to Nathan, but he just ignored me and turned to the script. Hello? Am I just a stranger danger now? We then tried the opening act, but since it was my first time being on a turntable, I took the wrong step and fell over. Nathan! I was blushing when he suddenly glanced at Luke and dropped me, almost kissing the floor. Right then, a girl barged in. Is everything ready for my set? You're late again, Stella. And actually, you and Winona are both gonna practice and we'll see who's right for the role. Winona who? As if this nobody can stroll in and try to steal my role? How snobby. She's lucky this nobody doesn't want to make a scene on her first day. During the break, I questioned Luke more on Stella. Stella is super talented. She's marvelous at dancing, singing, and acting. No surprise, though, because she's been training since she was little. That's exactly why we should just give her the role already. A waste of time dealing with amateurs. That was so rude. So much for ever thinking he was friendly. In the following weeks, I finally got a better grasp of my character. The female lead was a gentle, down-to-earth Blackfoot woman. Easy peasy. I just need to pretend to be my mom. <laughs> Only, my on-scene love interest Nathan was making things difficult. On stage, he refused to make eye contact with me, but he didn't have this trouble when he was up there with Stella. Every day I had lunch with Luke while Nathan and Stella were giggling in another corner, acting as if they were the most powerful couple here. Are they really in love? Oh, Winona, please. Why should you care? After lunch, I ignored Stella's glaring eyes and focused on being Nathan's lover on stage. 
What kind of singing is that? Give me a break already. That's enough, Stella. Actually, I just informed Mr. Killorn over lunch that Winona's getting the role. Ha! Huh, very funny! No, it's not a joke. Look at your performance recently, Stella. It's rather disappointing. Winona, keep up the good work. Stella looked like she'd had the blood sucked out of her. I excitedly beamed at Luke, but strangely he looked concerned and ran after Stella. Does he have feelings for her? See that? Why hasn't he just confessed his feelings for Stella already and stopped this unrequited love tragedy? Isn't it because you and Stella are together? And that's also why you're so half-hearted whenever you're on set with me? It's not like that. I just couldn't control myself every time our eyes met. What did he mean by that? Congrats, anyways. I always knew you deserved this role. He's right. I'd really worked super hard for this. I'm so close to achieving my dream now. The next day, I rushed into the first official rehearsal and acted my heart out in front of Mr. Killorn and the whole crew. I was dancing away to Luke's sentimental track when the door slammed open. It was, Mom! I can't believe you lied to me and came here to do these foolish antics! Oh no. Mr. Killorn turned pale while Jade gasped upon seeing Mom. I tried to tell Mom to let me finish this scene, but... Fine, be this way. Until you come to your senses, you're not my daughter anymore! Mum then stormed out of there. Mr. Killorn told everyone to take a break and also left. I stormed over to Luke and asked if he told my mum the truth. But right when he was stammering, Mr. Killorn came between us. I didn't know you had to lie to your mum to get here. Yeah, sadly. She knows about my acting dream, but she has always been so negative about it. Hmm, is that so? Well, you're doing a great job. Continue practicing for the play. And maybe... Take me to your mom sometime, and I'll try and explain this to her. Encouraged by the director's feedback, the next day I confidently acted my part. Yet Jade seemed dissatisfied and criticized my movements, saying they were too rigid. Winona, I'm giving the role to Stella. You need more training. What? I'm not some toy you can throw back and forth. Was it all just a show to get me and her to pit against each other? What was that about? Why the change? You're not qualified. Go back to your mother. What has this to do with my mother? I didn't know what was going on, but I was sure of one thing. I needed to prove myself, so I stayed at the studio practicing, swinging, and swaying my soul away under the studio light until I accidentally sprained my ankle. Right then, Nathan came out and helped me up. Why are you still here? I saw you stay, so I thought I'd stick around for a little longer. As he spoke, he gently pressed an ice bag on my ankle. I felt the butterflies flapping in my stomach, but suddenly remembered his attitude before and pushed him away, ready to stand up just to fall into his embrace again. You must think I'm so hot and cold, but I just didn't want Luke to misunderstand anything. What do you mean? We're just friends. And what's up with you and Luke? Then he told me how he and Stella were the best of friends back at acting school until Luke appeared. Luke was instantly attracted to Stella and asked Nathan to set them up. Nathan, of course, happily agreed. However, the next day, Stella suddenly expressed her feelings for Nathan right in front of Luke. Luke didn't take it too well and thought I was messing with him. He's resented me ever since. So, you and Stella are just friends? We are. Stella might appear childish, but she's good-natured. She's just... she's dealing with a lot inside. I've just been watching over her. But right now, she's gonna have to learn to stand on her own since I think I've met my guardian spirit. His guardian spirit? We were so close, I swear we were almost kissing. But I quickly pulled away, saying I gotta go practice. The final rehearsal is my only chance to get my role back now. I showed up just as a substitute today, but when everybody was ready to rehearse, the only person missing was Stella. No one seemed able to contact her, and the director was growing impatient. Jade had no other choice but to push me onto the stage. Luke didn't seem too happy with this replacement and suddenly played the piano much faster than expected. Flustered, I took a deep breath and let myself float naturally to his rhythm. During the intermission, I asked Luke what that was about. Drop it, Winona. I already knew. You got in here all thanks to your director, Dad. Yet you fooled me with your little story. It's you who forced Stella away from her chosen role. Who's my dad? Mr. Killorn? Right then I was called for the next act. Still puzzled by what Luke said, I couldn't focus on my part with Nathan. Suddenly, I heard Nathan scream my name and leapt to push me to the side. I fell on the floor and saw the massive chandelier land on Nathan. Everybody rushed to check on us, and among the crowd came, Mom? 
We were all waiting for the doctor to check on Nathan when Luke suddenly spoke out. I'm sorry for what I said, but Jade told me Mr. Killorn is your dad, and you guys forced Ella to drop her role. Mr. Killorn and I both gave Mom astounded eyes. Winona's my... my daughter? That's right, Andrew. But don't worry. As soon as Nathan's recovered, I'll bring Winona back home and will not bother you and Jade again. No, no, you've got it all wrong. Why didn't you tell me about our daughter? Jade said if I told you, she would harm Winona. Wait, does this have anything to do with the accident? Because right before the act, I saw Jade talking to a crew member who set up the stage for Nathan and Winona. I'll get this looked into at once. So, this play about Andrew and a Blackfoot woman falling in love, is it about you and Mom? Mr. Killorn didn't reply, but looked at Mom tenderly, and she burst out crying. Right then, the doctor came out, saying we could visit Nathan. Luke quickly pulled me aside, leaving the adults there. How are you feeling? Any discomfort? You're not mad at me anymore? Yeah, um, sorry for being a jerk. It's alright, dude. Go find Stella before she leaves. She said she was sick of being thrown around. She's taking a leave to reassess a few things. But why me? Aren't you? We're just friends. How many times do I have to tell you? Luke didn't even wait for Nathan to finish and rushed out of there. I wish them a happy ending. And it's indeed happy endings all round. Not only for Luke and Stella who are now officially an item, but also for Mom and Mr. Killorn. Or should I say, Dad? Our family has finally reunited. On the other hand, Jade vanished as soon as her schemes were out in the open. Turns out, all of this was because she'd been in love with my dad for years. So back when Mom was dating Dad, she told her lies about him to get her to leave. Furious that both Mom and I were back, she decided to make us go for good. Dad helped me get a spot in the Theater Academy in New York, but he misses Mom lots, so always makes excuses to bring me and Nathan back to Montana. You guys need more inspiration, right? New York's just all hustle and bustle. So, how about we move the studio back here? Nathan, what do you think? I don't know, but wherever you are, that's where I'll be. Blue sky, white clouds, golden sand. Such a perfect day for sunbathing on this luxury Hawaiian beach while being served by Kirby, my arch enemy. That brat used to tease me all the time about my old clothes and messy hair. Little did she know, I was secretly a millionaire. Earth to Clarine. Castle building all day won't fill your stomach. Finish your shift and go home. Well, Mary, who doesn't want to get rich? Sadly, some of us can only dream about it. If you want to be Cinderella, then go find yourself a prince. Just not Danny. He's just as poor as us. Do not underestimate my Danny. My precious heart fell for him for a reason. It's just that he doesn't seem to realize that we're destined for each other yet. But Mary was right. My dinner won't cook itself. Let's see what we can afford for tonight. My dad left us when I was four, and since then, mom worked her socks off to provide for us. So it was down to me to also work to save up for my law school dream. All of a sudden, groceries started raining down on me. Bottles tumbled off the shelves and broke into pieces right by my feet. Ah, is it an earthquake? I stooped down and prayed until it stopped. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but geez, it sure left a freaking mess. Warren, the store owner, looked distraught. This place was all he had, so I helped him clean up and place anything undamaged back on the shelves. Before you leave, please take this as a token of my gratitude. I hope it brings you luck. A lottery ticket? I don't know how this game works. I'll show you. It's simple. Each ticket has a unique set of numbers. Just check the results on TV tonight and see if they match. Let me see. Your numbers are 15, 26, 14, 48, 0, 7, 23. Hey, those are the lucky numbers that have been on my mind all day. I want that ticket. Kirby, stop poking your nose in my business, will you? Sorry, miss. That's the last ticket today, and I already gave it to Clarine. Then I'll buy it. Here's your two bucks. Give it to me. You wish. I didn't really care about this ticket, but there's no way I was going to let her get what she wanted. And surely, she wouldn't leave me alone. How about ten bucks? That's a fortune to the likes of you. No thanks. I'd rather win millions instead and make you my maid. Look, you'll never get anything from me, be it this ticket or Danny. Just give up. Fine! Let me skip this stupid ticket, but Danny, never! Why are we always bickering, you ask? Well, we're both competing for the heart of Danny. Tennis extraordinaire and brooding Adonis. Actually, I thought I had more advantage as he worked part-time at the same restaurant. But nope. Danny was such a cold fish. 
I tried again and again, but every single time, he just gave me a soulless thank you and that's it. If only I could build him his own tennis courts, perhaps he'd change his attitude. But that's impossible for a poor girl like me, unless I somehow hit the jackpot. The lucky numbers today are 48, 07, 15. Should I add winning the lottery to my daydream list? <laughs> 26, 14. Is it just me or do those numbers sound familiar? No way, it can't be. And the mega ball is 23. Now if your ticket has all six numbers, you win over 20 million dollars. Play on. Me. I think I just become a millionaire. God had answered my prayers. What? Kirby's here too? The ticket must have hit it for real. I rush there to rummage through the trash. And ah, here it is. It's mine. As if. Let's go ask Warren who this ticket belongs to then. Brilliant. And then give him a third of the prize? Do you really expect him not to ask for a share? Right. Okay, let it go and I'll give you a 30% share. Great ratio, but 30% is a perfect fit for you. I'll take 70%. And Danny. Oh, that's how you want to play. Fine then. How about whoever wins Danny's heart gets 70%? Deal. So we agreed to hide the lottery ticket in a trunk with two locks. Each of us kept one key to it. Then we buried it in a bush at school. Looks like the secret race between us starts now. Kirby wasted no time and brought Danny the showiest lunches ever. But he kept up his cold exterior and barely acknowledged her. Seems like I need a more delicate approach. So I told Mary to arrange a team building game among the restaurant staff, in which we all had to answer the same questions to understand one another better. Oh look! He liked watching Star Trek, listening to Sam Smith, and reading Harry Potter like me. Oh, Danny boy, I told you we were destined to be a pair. Next question. What is the key to maintaining a long-term relationship? There's our very first answer. Feelings? Come on, Danny, be realistic. What uses do feelings have if you can even afford to go on a date? Poor people can also be happy in love, but I don't think pragmatic people like you can. No, no, he misunderstood what I meant. After that, he ignored me completely. Worse still, Kooky Kirby never left him alone. She even brought the whole cheerleading team to do this ridiculous routine while he was playing. Who cheers on a tennis court? She was going big, so I needed to step up my game. It's time to bust out my college savings. I spent the whole day at the mall buying him gifts and giving myself a makeover. This is the first time in my life I've spent my hard-earned money without considering the price. It feels so good, but at the same time, kind of bad. But I could make it up with the lottery money once I got Danny's heart. Look, I saw this watch and I immediately thought of you. I even met a professional tennis player at the mall. Can you believe it? And they told me this racket is the best. What do you think? You're crazy. This costs thousands. Why are you doing this? Um, that's not the reaction I was expecting, but I like you, Danny. I've not been brave enough to tell you this because I had nothing, but soon my life would change and I can give you everything. I don't need those things. You're so wasteful and superficial. You really think money can buy anything, including feelings? Why was he so mad at me? I thought he must have noticed that I'd worked really hard for all this and even made myself look prettier for him. Okay, he might not like my gifts, but is it so bad that I want to be a little generous to myself now that I have some money? Things got even worse when later I arrived at work to see Kirby booking out the entire restaurant to let her, Danny, take a rest and enjoy dinner with her. Fine, you win, Kirby. I give up. <sighs> nothing, basically nothing went the way I wanted. My luck, my money, my man. Now I'm fine with just the 30% God gave me. I'm done chasing anyone. Only my stray friends understand me. Muffin, brownie, Oreo. Wait, where's Cupcake? Looking for him? Let him go. This wasteful, superficial girl needs to make sure he's not starving. So you're the one who feeds them every day? Why do you care? Go back to your date with Kirby. I'm just a materialist who thinks money solves everything. I'm sorry for how I acted earlier. It's just that, at home, I'm surrounded by people who are all about money. So I hate that way of life. Why are you talking like you come from money or something? Yeah, kinda. My parents are the presidents of Sunland Corp. What? The biggest furniture corporation in the city? Unbelievable! So why are you working part-time at a restaurant? I want to earn my own money. An independent life suits me much better. You're so silly. Why struggle if you don't have to? If I were you, my life would be so different. 
I'd make sure that my mom didn't need to work all the time to make ends meet. I could even go to any expensive law school I want and care for all the stray cats and dogs I find. Surprisingly, this time, Danny didn't look at me with jaded eyes like before. Instead, he just listened patiently and gave me the sweetest smile ever. But not love. That's one thing money can't buy. H how about Kirby? Did any of her grand gestures impress you? <laughs> I prefer the cats. Our talk has confirmed that there's still a chance for me. Kirby's only advantage over me is money, but Danny doesn't care about that anyway. Is that the new student? Seems like Danny just found a worthy opponent. He's Finn. Look how he smiles whenever his opponent catches up a point. Wait, did you just call Danny someone's opponent? Someone has a new crush. Who? who? Don't talk nonsense. Right then, a ball zoomed toward us. And holy moly, Finn caught it just mere inches from Kirby's face. Are you okay? She's fine. Her face always turns red. Nothing to do with a ball. Kirby was so embarrassed that she ran off. <laughs> It seems our race took a turn. But then, shockingly, Finn turned to me and asked for my number? Huh? Does my charm glow this much? Everyone knew I liked Danny, but he's such a riddle. Hmm, maybe I could use Finn as my last card to make Danny jealous and bait Kirby to give up on our deal. What a genius I am! Then, for the next few days, whenever Danny was around, I flirted with Finn and made sure Kirby saw us. One day, I made an excuse to borrow Finn's phone, then I secretly used it to send Danny a message to stir up his jealousy. If you don't like Clarine, then let me play with this innocent girl for a bit. And Kirby also needs a kick to admit her feelings as well, right? Actually, I like you. Looking into your eyes, I know you also have feelings for me, so... And finally, I set a date for them at the tennis score tonight at 8. If Danny doesn't want me to get hurt and Kirby doesn't want to miss her true love, they'll show up. Then I covered up my tracks, blocked both our numbers, and returned his phone. Thank you so much. Are you free tonight? Come to the tennis court. I have something important to tell you. Oh god, Finn looks like he just won the Wimbledon. That night, Finn got there early and was really excited. Let's see who will raise the curtain. Ah, it's Kirby. Oh Finn, you had me at hello. But admitting my feelings means I lose the deal with Clarine, so... What do you mean? What deal? No, no, don't get me wrong. Actually, we won the lottery and made a deal to share it. Anyways, silly me. Money can compare to you. Lottery? You two share it? Why did she even mention the money? Right when it's getting messy, Danny turned up. Bastard, now you're two-timing? Danny, why are you here? He's just playing with you. This jerk is seeing both you and Kirby. Don't let him fool you. I think Finn is a nice guy. Plus, I've told you how I felt, but you've never seemed to like me back. So Finn, we... Finn told me he liked me! Clarine, I like you. More than you know. Can't you see? I've given a lot of... hints. I always make excuses to go home with you. I told you that feelings are the most important thing to me. As in my feelings for you. Really? Idiot, how am I supposed to pick up those hints? So this daydreamer wasn't just imagining things? Turns out my plan actually did succeed. Kirby, it's true, I do like you, but I thought you were out of my league, so I just wanted to ask Clarine for help. Oh, how nice. Kirby, with a huge grin, then admitted I won, then she dragged Finn away. Hmm, I guess my biggest win is successfully pairing up two couples. The next morning, Kirby and I opened the trunk to get the ticket, when to our utter shock, Finn swooped in and snatched it away. While we were still processing what was going on, he ran off with our millions. But then, a shadow sent him tumbling to the ground. Danny? I saw him following you two and knew he was up to something shady. Then, Finn confessed that he transferred schools and approached me for the lottery ticket following his dad's order, who's none other than... Warren! He knew it was a jackpot winning ticket, so he set up a plan to steal it from me. I'm so sorry. My dad's a gambling addict, which left him heavily in debt, and only this ticket could save him. Oh, Finn. I believe he's not a bad person. This ticket was originally from Warren anyway, so we both agreed to give him a share to pay off his debt. Finn was moved and handed the ticket back to us. On learning this, Warren thanked us and offered to drive us to Tallahassee to claim our prize. He even carefully got me to double-check that my ticket was in my purse. But halfway there, the car suddenly broke down, so the four of us got out and gave it a push. But as we started pushing, Warren suddenly sped away, leaving all of us standing there in shock. Where's your purse, Clarine? I left it in the... car. 
That greedy snake Warren did this on purpose to run away with a ticket. Now what to do? Walk back home or walk to Tallahassee? Calm down. Danny already has a backup plan. This is the real ticket. Enjoy the view for now. A taxi is coming to pick us up. Actually, the moment Warren offered to drive us all the way to Tallahassee, I sensed something sketchy. So I swapped the tickets. <sighs> My dad's gone too far this time. He needs to stop gambling and work hard to pay off his debts instead. Finally, we got the cash prize. However, the four of us decided not to divide it anymore. Instead, we're building a shelter for stray animals together. Surprisingly, our project soon reached many philanthropists and now our fund has been expanded across the US. Since then, Kirby is no longer obnoxious. Now she even wants to become a veterinarian. And me? I will continue to work my way into the law school of my dreams. My hard work has really paid off because they just sent me an acceptance letter. I might not be rich, but in all honesty, it doesn't matter, as I couldn't be happier. Hey, I'm Esther of the rising TikTok channel at Aesthetic, where I share my passion for fashion. Look at my newest design. Cool, huh? Who would have thought newspaper was a great material for making dresses? I was trying one on and posing for photos when I heard a knock on my door. That's my mom and dad. Esther, we have some good news. We're moving. What? I'm being transferred to another branch in San Francisco. Can you believe we'll be living in that sunny city? N no, no, we can't move. I'm, I'm a senior already. All my friends are here. Mom! Just get over it and start packing. This is our one chance at a better life. Why can't they understand that I'm not simply shy, but actually have major social anxiety? It's a real thing that I can't just get over. That's also why my 2 million TikTok followers still haven't seen my face yet. I could barely handle the stress from across the screen, never mind being alone in a brand new school full of strangers. Oh gosh, this place must be twice as big as my old school. It's gonna take forever to find the bathroom. Man, it feels like a thousand eyes are on me. Or maybe not, but I can't risk looking around. What if someone makes eye contact? My palms are sweaty, my heartbeat is so loud I can hardly hear anything else. But then, some hot couple walked in and literally ate up the entire hallway's attention. Good, surely no one would notice me now. It was so exhausting running from one class to the next. Now, where do I sit? I walked over to a table, but no one batted an eye. I wasn't sure if I should sit down or not, when suddenly, a pretty girl appeared. Sky blue. Sorry? Anyway, you're new, right? I'm Jojo, class president. Come sit with us. I followed her to another table. Hi guys, got space for two more? Yeah, sure, the more the merrier. Oh no, that girl doesn't sound too happy about having me here. But it would be too awkward to just get up and leave. Uh, hi, I'm Esther. Hey, didn't know they serve fresh tomatoes here. Finish your lunch, Amanda. We have homework to do. Phew, yeah, think about your homework, guys. Don't mind me. I got to know the school layout a bit better, so the next day wasn't as hard. Until I saw some girl waving at me. She looked like Jojo, but her eyes weren't blue. Must be her twin sister or a doppelganger waving at someone behind me. You really just got ghosted in real life? And you call yourself class president? I flinched. So that actually was the class president from yesterday? How strange. Then my absolute worst nightmare came true in biology class. We had to work in pairs. Okay, which group would like a new member? Anyone? Please help a girl out. I see you're in a desperate need of a partner, Zeke. Why don't you raise your hand so Esther can see where you are? I saw an arm at the back of the class, so I walked towards it. Hi, newbie. Esther, right? My name is... Baby Blue Emerald Green? Hey, do my eyes look funny to you, new girl? Jeez, I didn't mean to upset him. So I ended up explaining that I'd had issues with eye contact since I was little. So my mom made me pay attention to strangers' eye colors to make it seem like I looked them in the eye. She even asked me what color their eyes were afterwards to make sure I did what she asked. Well, even though I did, that trick never actually helped me get over my social anxiety. In fact, I usually only notice other people's eye color, not their names or how the rest of their faces look. You're weird, but I believe you. I don't like interacting with other humans either. They tend to pick on me because of my eyes.
It shouldn't come as a surprise that us shy kids got along pretty well. Zeke taught me biology and chemistry after class, while I helped him with his Spanish homework. Thanks to him, lunchtime isn't as stressful anymore. We could chat away about anime for hours, and he's supportive of my fashion obsession. So I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my TikTok account. He still liked to tease me from time to time, though. I reader, what color are their eyes? You know, the powerhouses, Colin and Amanda over there. No way. I never look pretty guys in the eye, cause I'll immediately turn into a walking tomato. Same thing for hot girls. I don't want them to think I'm trying to pick a fight with them or something. You're that avoidant? Have you ever made eye contact with anyone here except me? Yep. Jojo, the blue-eyed girl. Blue? You know her eyes are brown, right? She likes wearing contacts. Jojo changes her eye color, hair, and accessories every week. She's quite a chameleon. Too bad she seems so smitten with that boring guy Colin Gray. Wow, someone clearly has a crush on Jojo. <laughs> but actually, I think Z could be quite a catch too, if he wasn't so insecure about his heterochromia. Speaking of Jojo, have you heard about her Halloween party? What about it? Well, I thought about going, but I have no costume. Forget it. It's not like she'd notice me there anyway. No, you should definitely go. I can help in the costume department. So, here we are. I'd successfully transformed my timid friend into King Lelouch. Who else but Zeke and his unique eye colors could pull this off? As his personal stylist, he insisted I come with him. I'm not even dressed up though. Oh man, I can hear my heart pounding already thinking about how many people will be in there. But I'm not the type to abandon my friend. So, let's go. As soon as everyone saw his majesty, they went silent, then erupted when he flipped his cape. Look at him! <laughs> his ego must be through the roof right now. I then swiftly stepped back to a corner. So, this is what a house party is like. Suddenly, I overheard two girls talking. Aesthetic is definitely from our school, or Zeke had some connections. Yeah, I swear this is the exact same outfit Aesthetic has been prepping on her channel. Oh, come on. There could be hundreds of Lelouch costumes during this spooky season. Girls, please stop speculating. Aesthetic is totally not from this school. I- Hey there, what's your costume? A shy, cute girl? I- I- um, nice Stranger Things shirt. Yeah, I look even better than Eddie, don't I? Um, yeah, totes. So I have this thing. Gotta go, bye! Then they ran straight out of there. That was too much socializing for one day. After that party, I noticed Zeke started to hang out with Jojo and became much more confident. I was happy for him, but he was no longer the same guy. One time, we agreed to study together in the library, but he stood me up. When we met the following day, he said he hadn't touched his homework yet because he was out with Jojo. And then asked to copy mine. Sure, fine. But when he was done, he flat out refused to teach me chemistry as he was too busy. Things were that way for a while. Until today when I found out the shocking truth. Esther, I only keep her around to do my Spanish homework. You know she's a total buzzkill. Excuse me? Your free homework trial has expired. So much for we're friends, huh? Everyone, look! Someone finally came to some self-realization. How adorable! <laughs> Tell them, Zeke! Did you know she has to make her own clothes? Pathetic! Who was this guy? He's the total opposite of the boy I'd got to know over the past couple of months. Am I in the upside down? It's over. Zeke and I were practically strangers now. Back to my gloomy and lonely life. Annoyingly, I saw Zeke again that day, this time on the school paper. This smug jerk gave an interview on the now famous Lelouch look. However, in that article, Jojo claimed to be aesthetic, the creator behind that costume, while Zeke backed up her entire story. What in the world? And Jojo even showed some of the sketches that I shared on my account. I was furious and went to confront Jojo, but somehow she didn't seem to be faced at all. <laughs> So what if you're the real aesthetic? I can be her too, don't you think? If you have a problem with that, then let's go sort it out. Attention everyone! This is Esther. You probably don't know her, but who cares? She has something to share. The floor is yours, girl. Everyone's gaze turned towards me. Holy moly, where should I look? Why is this so different from talking to the camera? My entire body went into crisis mode. God no, something's coming up. Run! Although I calmed myself down, I couldn't face anyone right now. This is the worst day of my life. Suddenly, someone tapped my shoulder. Amanda? What does this social butterfly want? Did she just ask me if I was okay?
Okay. No, I'm not okay. Why is it that girls like you and Jojo, who already have everything, always want to take away everything? Hey, I'm just trying to be nice here. If it wasn't for my silly little friend... What? What are you talking about? Never mind. Sorry, but you don't seem okay. Come with me. I think I know how to make you feel better. Come on. Skipping one class won't kill you, but bad mental health will. I wiped away my tears and went with Amanda, even though I barely knew her. But she had a point. The last thing I need right now is a stuffy classroom. Here it is. Go inside. There'll be someone who can help you. That's weird, but alright. I stepped inside, and it was like being hugged with the smells of wood and paper. It felt healing, for sure. I was browsing through the store, then saw Colin walk over. Startled, I stuck my face into an empty slot on a bookshelf to avoid him, but... <coughs> This place is filled with dust. Surprisingly, Colin only smiled and gently wiped the dust off my face. Um, if you're looking for your girlfriend, Amanda just left. She's not my girlfriend. And actually, I asked her to bring you here. Wh what Why? Just calm down. I got you something. How do you know my favorite genre? Because I've seen you read to calm yourself down before. Turns out, Colin had been observing me from a distance for some time, so he even remembered what I usually read. He was hesitant to talk to me though, afraid that all the unwanted attention he might attract would make me feel uncomfortable. But now, everyone knows I like you. Sorry about that. Don't be. It's my fault and my anxieties. I can help you with that. Esther, would you go to prom with me? How will that help? It will. Trust me. Oh, his eyes are... gray? I realized I've been talking to him all this time just fine without using the old trick. What if this guy really could help me? On prom night, Colin drove me there. While he was parking his car, I waited in front of the venue. Out of nowhere, Zeke approached me. Listen, there's not much time. You gotta listen to me. Jojo plans to give you an award, but it's only to get you to stand on the X mark on the stage where the trap door is. She wants to humiliate you in front of the entire school because you're with the guy she likes. So be careful. What game are you trying to play here? Why are you telling me this? I want to make things right. Jojo took advantage of my feelings for her, and I was too blind to see that she only liked Colin, and she's been using me to hurt you. This is my chance to make it up to you, so please, don't go up there. It's a trap. Stop it already. I won't let you make a fool of me again. Right on time, Colin came to the rescue. Haven't you done enough? Stay away from her. I'm truly sorry, Esther. Inside, we were greeted by Amanda. Congrats, bro. I'm finally free from the Collins rumor girlfriend label. Jojo must be green with envy seeing how cute you two are together. Right. She's here, as well as hundreds of other people. Nope, I can't do this. I quickly crawled under a table and curled up into a ball. Still, Colin remained patient. You are absolutely stunning tonight. Honestly, your dress is amazing. Come out. Let the whole world see you. The world will only laugh in my face. Okay, then let me join you. It's actually quite cozy down here. What are you doing? Well, tonight is a special night, and my date's a special girl. So I figured we could totally enjoy it in an unusual way. I feel like my insides just turned into a hot, liquidy mess. Who would have thought that I could meet someone who goes out of their way to make me happy? We chatted for a while, then noticed that the lights outside were dimmed for the slow dance. Let's go. Hand in hand, Colin and I swayed to the melody, feeling like we were the only people in the room. Then, the music suddenly stopped. They were about to present tonight's awards for remarkable students. And now, best dressed of the night award goes to Esther Crawford! No way! What Zeke said immediately came to my mind. I turned around to see Zeke looking concerned and shaking his head. Maybe he'd been telling the truth after all. You don't have to go up there if you don't feel like it. Colin was as understanding as always. But then I saw Jojo's smug face. I couldn't let her win again. So I mustered all my courage and stepped onto the stage, but steered clear of the X mark Zeke mentioned. Thank you, everybody. But I believe another person deserves this award much more than me. She's none other than our hardworking class president, Jojo. That's so sweet of you, but it's yours. Please, step up to receive it. You mean here? No, one step forward. Here? Jojo became impatient and rushed towards me. No, you have to stand here! Right back at you, Jojo. Have a taste of your own medicine. Now that's some headline material for the school paper. <laughs> so, today is the day. 
My long overdue face reveal. This is such a beautiful dress, right guys? If you're wondering who this strange girl is, Hi, I'm Esther, and I'm the person behind At Aesthetic. This dress right here, it's what I wore to senior prom. Settle in, I'm doing a face reveal and story time video today. I was casually walking along the hallway, just minding my own business, when I felt a cold breeze rush through the hallway. I turned my head to see, and oh, it was Natasha. Ooh. I didn't mean to look her in the eye, but I did. Oh no, was she going to hit me? Panicked, I quickly glared down at my feet. My heart was thudding with fear, and inside my head, I repeated, Please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. But to my relief, she walked past me. Phew! Hi, I'm Marcus, and you might be wondering why I'm so afraid of that girl, right? Well, there's a reason why her nickname is Silent But Deadly. She's the tallest girl in the school. Intimidating, and she never utters a word. The school was full of rumors about her, such as how the last kid who messed with her ended up in intensive care. Nobody, and I mean nobody, should ever look her in the eye. Not unless they want to end up unconscious. I definitely just had a lucky escape. Thankfully, not all the girls in my school were as terrifying as Natasha. Nope. Instead, there was this really cute girl named Naomi. She's beautiful, sweet, and gentle. Only, she's also super popular and is dating Nicholas, the captain of the basketball team. So I just kept my feelings to myself and carried on with my life. <sighs> but wait, where's my notebook? I guess I left it back in the science lab. So I rushed in there and... Oh no, Nicholas was there and he was reading my notebook. I quickly grabbed it off of him, but it was too late. He'd already taken pictures of the song lyrics I wrote about my feelings for Naomi. Blast it! So let me get this straight, a nerd like you dares to daydream about Naomi? Uh, but we have a problem here. She's my girlfriend, don't you know that? Uh, wait, it's not like that. I'll stay away from her, I promise. Nicholas gave me this unnerving look. Ugh. No good thing could ever come from a look like that. I braced myself for what he was about to do next. You have to do everything I say, else I'm going to ruin your life. Huh? Was he being serious? Judging by his devious smirk, yep, he was 100% being serious. I want you to ask Natasha out. Make sure you do it in front of the whole class. What? N Natasha? That scary girl? How could I... If you say no, the entire school will know about this. Then he waved his phone in front of me. Ugh, that vile Nicholas. But I couldn't risk my song being sent to everyone. So it looked like I had no choice. So the following day, I walked over to Natasha's desk and asked her, Natasha, um, will you be my girlfriend? The whole class was silent. Then they burst out laughing. She glared at me. Ugh, this wasn't good. I winced, preparing for the death punch. But instead, she led me out into a corner of the hallway. Then she gave me this weak smile, followed by a nod. Oh my god, did she just agree to be my girlfriend? This is crazy. It was completely beyond my expectations. But, whew, at least I was still alive, right? And that's how I ended up dating the scariest girl in school. She never spoke to me, not even a word. So I just helped her with her studies and carried her stuff around. We also exchanged numbers, but we only chatted through messages. Then one day when I was on my way to have lunch with Natasha, Nicholas strolled over to me and told me I had to take her to the cinema to catch this awful looking rom-com, which didn't seem like her thing at all. But what other choice did I have? Nicholas' words were orders. So I asked her over lunch, and to my surprise, Natasha smiled, then gave me a big thumbs up as agreement. When I went to pick up Natasha, she was already waiting for me on her porch. She walked over with a notepad. Curious, I asked her why she had it, and she wrote, I won't be able to text you during the movie, so this will have to do. Yup, Natasha has always been different from everyone else, so I didn't ask anymore. During the film, I noticed Natasha was crying. So when it was over and we stopped for lunch, I teased her. I saw you crying during the movie. She slammed her notepad on the table after she wrote, I was not crying. I just laughed and took her home. Hmm, maybe she wasn't as scary as the rumors made her out to be. To be honest, she was also quite cute. <laughs> the more time I spent with Natasha, the more I started to warm to her. There was something I liked about her, even though we had only communicated through sticky notes. 
I was desperate to hear her voice, so I hatched a plan. When we were in the library on a study date, I picked up an old book and blew the dust in her face. She almost sneezed. But before she did, she placed her hand over her mouth and raced into the girl's bathroom. Then she returned wearing a mask. After that, I tried to make her laugh. I quickly took two pencils from the table and stuffed them into my nose and started making ugly faces. But Natasha just glared at me and handed me a note. If you continue to do these ridiculous things, there will be payback. Ha! Huh, no way was I giving up. So the next day, when I saw her by her locker, I rushed over to her and began imitating the voices of the minions. I thought it would definitely work this time, but no. Instead, she punched me in the arm. Ouch! Yep, I now learned that the rumor about her inhuman strength was not an exaggeration. So I just gave up and our relationship continued. Then one weekend, when I was at Natasha's house to study, I went down to the kitchen to get a drink, just as her mom returned from the grocery store. As I helped her unpack, we started talking. She told me about Natasha's love of collecting glass art, the pieces of which filled the house. Then her mom touched my shoulder and thanked me for making her daughter happy again. Oh man, this was awkward. Now I felt super bad. To divert the convo, I asked if Natasha talked at home, but she just smiled and replied, Natasha's such a quiet kid, right? Then she told me how it's because Natasha's always been taller than the other kids, but she has a squeaky voice. This led to lots of teasing, and once she got so upset, she pushed a boy over and accidentally caused him to have a nosebleed. Since then, people started to shun her, so she withdrew from herself and stayed silent. Hearing this made me feel so guilty. What I was doing was wrong, and Natasha didn't deserve this. Then her mom said something that truly shocked me. In middle school, this one girl named Naomi was horrible to all. The mean comments got so bad she refused to go into school for weeks at a time. Huh? Naomi? The same Naomi I know? No way! Confused, I told Natasha's mom I needed to leave and left her looking bewildered as I ran out of there. My mind was a mess. I had a crush on a mean girl. And I'm just as bad, if not worse, after what I did to Natasha. Then my phone rang with a text from Natasha. It said, Sorry if my mom said something she shouldn't have. You okay? I texted back. We need to talk tomorrow, please. So we decided to meet at her house the next day. Alone in her living room, I told her everything, including my notebook, liking Naomi and how Nicholas was blackmailing me. Natasha, please, you have to believe me. I'm sorry I did this to you. I saw the hurt look in her eyes. Then she threw a note at me and ran to her room. The note told me to get out, but before I did, I stood on the other side of her door. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I couldn't continue our relationship on a lie. Look, I like you, and I don't want to deceive you anymore. After that, I left, and I also texted Nicholas that I didn't care if he told everyone. I'm done being his puppet. The next day, I expected school to be intolerable, but to my surprise, nothing happened. Instead, I saw that Natasha was trying to sort out her locker. A crowd had gathered around her, and Naomi was taunting her. How does it feel to know that even your boyfriend likes me more? <laughs> he doesn't like you. Natasha carried on sorting out her books, but I could see that she was fighting back tears. Furious, I pushed past them all and told Naomi to stop. She just jokingly said, You know, if you wanted to date me, you could have just asked. You didn't have to spend so many months suffering with this giant scarecrow. You're right. I did like you back when I thought you were a nice person. But now I know the true you. You're a coward who only feels good when it's at the expense of someone's misery. And I can see why you target Natasha the most because she has two things you'll never have, a true, kind heart and a loving spirit. After that, I pulled Natasha away and told her how sorry I am. But she didn't even glance at me and just walked off. A few days later, after PE class, I was about to go to the locker room when a classmate, Dante, came up to me. Marcus, help me carry the PE equipment into the storage room, please. I have a stomachache. He hugged his stomach, then hurriedly ran away. Without thinking much, I packed up the equipment and carried it into the storage room. As soon as I put it down, I realized that Nicholas, Naomi, and some guys from the basketball team were waiting there for me. Oh, well, Marcus, do you really like that weird Natasha? Didn't see that coming. Then the whole group burst into laughter. You have no right to say that to her. Take a look at yourself. Whoa, are you defending her? Then she turned to Nicholas. Babe, show him who's the boss here. Then she pulled out her phone and started recording. 
Nicholas smirked, then grabbed my shirt collar with one hand and reached out his fist to me with the other. I tried to struggle but couldn't get out. He was too strong. Knowing I was doomed, I closed my eyes and awaited his punch, but suddenly a loud shout came out. Stop! I opened my eyes to see Natasha and a teacher standing in front of the door. Turns out she overheard Dante bragging to some kid about Nicholas's plan. So she came to my rescue. I looked at her gratefully, but she turned away to avoid my gaze. Meanwhile, Nicholas hastily released my collar and lied to the teacher that we were just chatting. But of course, he didn't believe him and summoned them all to the supervisor's room. After that incident, Nicholas, Naomi, and the rest of the basketball team were suspended from school for two weeks. They deserved it. But who cares? I have more important things on my mind, such as winning back Natasha. I knew that her birthday was coming up, and I remembered how she loved glass art. So I bought her a glass art figure of Cinderella's glass slippers, with a ticket to senior prom and a card saying, Thank you, and happy birthday. I know what you did doesn't mean you forgive me, but I want to be your real boyfriend. So I left you a ticket for senior prom. If you come and dance with me, then I know you'll give me another chance. If not, then I know that it's over. But remember, you are a special person and deserve the best. The night of prom came and I was stuck there all alone, feeling like a fool. This sucked, but after what I did, it was what I deserved. I didn't want to stick around here without her. So I was about to leave, but then my classmate tapped my shoulder and gestured for me to turn around. OMG. It was Natasha in the most beautiful crimson red dress. She walked over to me and then reached out her hand to ask me to dance. And of course, I accepted. As the song came to an end, she leaned in and whispered to me, Thank you, my hero. I can safely say that was the happiest night of my life, as it led to me having the best girlfriend ever. Oh, also her voice is actually really cute, although she does get annoyed with me when I tell her that. (laughs) 